Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. And what is your pleasure this time? Let me fill your cup. Two icy fingers of terror, add equal parts of mystery and suspense, and top with a dash of the unknown. Settle back and sip, and we shall consider the wisdom of the ancient Tibetan sage Ao Chan. One day a disciple asked, Master, is the book of each man's life written by himself or by the immortal gods? And the Holy One replied, By both. The gods write only two pages, the first and the last. Man writes all the others himself. And if the Master has spoken truly, perhaps each of us might stop to consider what he has written now and then. Our story this time deals with the page before the last in the book of a young lady's life. One moment, Sergeant. Yes, what is it? I intend to kill you. What? Put down that pistol. Oh, certainly. After I fired it. You can't kill a police officer in broad daylight and hope to get away with it. Oh, I'm sure I can. Just a minute. Now, it won't do you any good to rush me. I can squeeze this trigger faster than you can move. Stop! Why don't people believe me? Our mystery drama, The Weavers of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and imported Vigna Rosé wine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Sit around your radio Listening to our mystery show With someone you'd like to know And Vina Rosé Pull the shades and lock the door Turn the sound up even more Get a glass and quickly pour Vina Rose, we hope you'll find our story strange and frightful. We know you'll find our Vina wine delightful. Now it's time that we commence with a tale of great suspense. What 
see you with compliments of in your own Supported by Hugh Blind, Hopkins, Connecticut. Now through February the 23rd, Spencer's is selling its entire stock of thousands of men's and ladies' suits, sport coats, overcoats, leisure suits, simulated leather jackets, overcoats, insulated jackets, dresses and pants suits, all weather coats, originally up to $100, now $11, none or higher. This means you can choose from our entire stock of thousands of $39.95 to $100 suits, sport coats, wide, medium, and narrow lapels, 100% wools and double-knit polyesters, also overcoats, all weather coats, heavy car coats, simulated leather jackets, thousands to pick from. All $11. None are higher. You can't pay more than $11 for any garment in our stores. Hundreds just arrived this week, which we were going to sell for much more, but we put them on the racks for $11. Spencer's, 322 North Michigan Avenue, phone 263-4700. Smaller quantities at 4933 Dempster and our new store at 15507 South Cicero Avenue, Oak Forest. Open 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, Sundays 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sale ends February 23rd. Here is Eleanor Brody Walking down the street on a quiet, sunny Saturday morning On her way to Frank's Market to buy a packet of special British breakfast tea Golden-haired, green-eyed, willowy Eleanor You'd never take her for 32 She looks at least 10 years younger but that doesn't matter anymore. She'll never see 33. Tall, attractive Eleanor Brody is about to become a statistic. And as Eleanor enters Frank's market, Frank himself is at the register. Bald and chubby, good-natured Frank. And he's about to become a statistic, too. And, waiting to pay for her purchases, elderly Mrs. August Asuyuk, soon she will also be a statistic. Look through the window. A car has just pulled up. A thin, very pale young man steps out. His right hand is in his jacket pocket. He is headed for the store. For lack of a better name, let us call him a maker of statistics. Where's it all going to end, huh, Frank? I was talking to the mister just last night. He says we'll have to learn how to live on air. Wait a second, Frank, I forgot. Some chocolate for my little granddaughter. I'll go get it. All right, hold it. Hold it now. Don't move. Oh, it's a sticker. Oh, oh, shut up. Oh, shut up. Step away from that register there, Bolly. And you, Blondie. Blondie, stand next to him. Don't, don't shut up, please. I said shut up. I have children. Grandchildren. I told you to shut your mouth. He's going to kill us. I can see it in his eyes. Murderers. Assassins. Who beats up? Who beats up? No, we got nothing on it. It was a stick-up, and it's a new breed of punk. The old-time guys, they'd at least let you live. These crumbs, you don't give them the money, they kill you. You do give them the money, they kill you. Yeah, I know you got to print something, but... Well, you can't squeeze blood out of a stone. When I get something, I'll give you something. Well, look who's here. Hello, Captain Gordon. Bobby Clifton. What are you doing in this place? <laughs> it's only for detectives. You want to see my badge? How are things in the youth section? Artie, I want you to give me a temporary transfer back to homicide. Why? Those grocery store killings this morning. Yeah? What would you want with that? I knew the girl. I knew Eleanor Brody. Yeah? We went to school together. This is ten years ago. We were, well, sort of engaged. What does that mean, sort of? It didn't work out. Oh, why? Why? I wanted to be a cop and she couldn't see it. I've been married 25 years and my wife still can't see it. Anyway, we decided to break up. You mean she did? Mm Mm-hmm. And I never saw her again. But it was yesterday, Friday... I got a phone call. She called me just like that. Just like that? It was as if we'd seen each other the day before. She said, Bobby, I must talk to you. Come over to my place tomorrow morning and we'll have breakfast. That would have been this morning. Yeah. So? Well, I... 
I got mad. It was the way she said it, I guess, as if nothing had happened. Like, drop whatever you're doing and come running just because I snapped my fingers. Yeah, that's how they are, Bobby. So I said I happened to be tied up, and she said... She said, never mind. Forget it. I'm sorry, Bobby. It took me nearly all this time to get over it. And I wasn't going to start... Well, I guess I never really got over it. Anyhow, this morning I set out for her apartment. There on the corner I saw the squad cars. Artie, I want to work on this case. Uh, What's to work on, Bobby? Some nervous punk gets trigger happy. Where do you find him? You don't. But one day some hood who faces a rap makes a deal for himself by blowing the whistle on a pal. I want to work on the case, Artie. I know, I know. You figured if you'd gone there when she asked you, she'd be alive now. (laughs) And so it's a whole guilty thing. I should have gone to see her when she called me. Bobby, it's not going to help. I keep thinking about that phone call. She... She sounded scared. You're building it up in your head. She was scared of something. She said, I must talk to you. Not I want to or I'd like to, but I must. Now, why did she say must? Because she figures she overlooked a good bet ten years ago. Artie, I failed her. You have got to let me work on the case. Work on what? There's nothing to go on. No witnesses, nothing. Why do you insist that it was an ordinary stick-up? What else could it be? Suppose it was something else. Like what? Artie, let me work on it. (sighs) All right, but don't get in anybody's way. The old lady, Mrs. Olga Stasiuk. I understand she's still alive. Uh, Just about. All right. Now go to the hospital and see her. Nobody can see her. She's in intensive care. I'll see her. I know, Sergeant, this is important for the police, but the patient can't see anyone. Doctor, she doesn't have to see me. I just want to see her. You mean you just want to look at her? Why? Why? The nurse says she keeps muttering something. Now, perhaps I can catch a word or two. Oh, all right. As long as she isn't disturbed. (laughs) Funny how things are interrelated, Sergeant. What's that, Doctor? These two women, the young one who died and Mrs. Stasiuk, who may not live out the day. Now, the younger one, Miss Brody, her name was, she was here about a week ago. What for? Well, it was midnight. She couldn't reach her own doctor, so she came to emergency. Why? Well, it seems she had a very severe, serious skin irritation all over her arms and back. What caused it? I don't know. She didn't want to stay for tests, so we gave her something for superficial relief. And she probably consulted her own physician the next day, and here she is, in the hospital again. But this time in the morgue. Oh, but you want to see Mrs. Stasiuk. <laughs> Seems to be trying to say something. Poor woman. She can't seem to form the words. Maybe not the English words. It's a foreign language. It doesn't sound like anything at all to me. Her name is Stasiuk. Olga Stasiuk. Now, it could be Russian or Polish. Doctor, I've got to come back here again with a tape recorder. And you'd better hurry. She's getting weaker. It's Russian, Artie. Russian. Well, what does that mean? Look, there's an Orthodox church around the corner. It turns out to be her church. The priest says the tape is hard to understand, that he can make out some of it. Well, what's she saying? She's trying to describe a killer. That word, ubitsa, or something like that, that means assassin, murderer. And he could be an albino. What? She uses the word for pink. A word like hrosavi, in connection with eyes and hair. And there's one key word. Kalbin, I think. It could either be the killer's name... Well, uh, are there any local punks named K? 
Calvin? Or, more likely, it's the Russian word Kalbin or Khalbin, which means albino or a guy with real light-colored hair and eyes. Whitey. That's right. Whitey Barrows. It can't be. Why not? Because, as far as we know, Whitey's a hitman for some of the biggest mobs. He gets 20, 30 grand a contract. This holdup could have been a contract. Oh, a little grocery store keeper. Your ex-girlfriend, this elderly Russian lady, to whom are they worth 20, 30 grand? Look, if it wasn't a contract, what was Whitey doing in on it? You know the terrible thing here? This Whitey, this million-dollar killer, he can just be walking along the street. He needs some loose change. Maybe he's left his money home. So he walks into the first store he sees. And what's he going to get? A hundred bucks? Look at how easy he is to describe. He knows he'll have to kill every living soul in the place. All that for a hundred bucks? Yeah, Bobby. He would do all that for just a hundred bucks. That's what we're dealing with. Well, we better pick him up. Eleanor was in trouble. That's why she called me. But you don't know that. Whitey was paid to kill her and to make it look as if she's the accidental victim of an ordinary stick-up. He works it that way. And just killed two other people. Okay, so now you tell me why she was marked and by who. I don't know. Look, maybe she was running around with Whitey and eh, she might have done something he didn't like. Yes, like what? I don't know like what. Maybe like phoning you, for instance. Yes? Dora Hastings? Yes. I'm a police detective. May I come in? Of course, please do. Thank you. It's about Eleanor, isn't it? I've already talked to some other officers. You were her roommate? Yes, I... I still can't believe it. I mean, here was a girl with everything to live for. The breaks were really starting to come her way. What breaks? You name it, all of them. She'd finally broken into the design field. She got that great consulting job with Wainwright. Yes? And she was getting married. Yeah, she grew up at last. She figured it was time to put out the torch. The torch? Oh, some fellow she'd gone to school with years ago. They had an argument over something or other, and that was it. For years, maybe she thought he might call her, but he didn't. Can you believe a thing like that? Yes. So she settled for the boss's nephew at Wainwright. Can you imagine settle for Lester Crane? Settle for a guy who has either 30 or 40 million dollars? But that's how she put it. She was one of a kind, that girl. Tell me, uh, recently, did she seem upset about anything? Well, yes, I would say so. Can you tell me what it was? I don't know. I asked her, and she said it was just nerves. What reason would there be for nerves, as she put it? Well, that's what I could never understand. She was sitting on top of the world, yet she... She was terrified. Terrified? It's a pretty strong word. It is. She was terrified. Well, weren't you concerned? I was. But if she made up her mind not to tell you anything, you couldn't shake her. Yes, I know. You know? Well, how would you know that? Oh, I, uh... I know girls like that. Now, you have no idea what could have caused her to be so frightened. No. Besides, does it matter anymore? She's dead. Try to remember everything you can about her being frightened. Just how bad was it? Do you want to know? Last week, she got up in the middle of the night. She couldn't sleep. She was irritated. Irritated by what? Her body was irritated. What? You know, you can get skin rashes from nervousness and tension. She called for a cab and went right to the hospital. And then? She came back the next morning. She was better. Anyhow, she seemed different. In what way? Quiet. She was quieter, calmer. Actually, she would keep muttering the same thing. What same thing? I have no idea. It sounded like EL-77. E-L-77. What's that? I can't figure it out. She just keeps saying it the way people do when something bothers Well, didn't you ask her what it meant? Well, yes. And she told me right off to forget it. E-L-77. Well, I don't even know if that's right. It just sounded something like that. Well, yesterday she said, there's only one man in the world who can help me. She was going to call this fellow and ask him to come see her. Did she say who? No, I was in the other room when she called him. 
And I guess he must have turned her down because she said later, it doesn't matter now. And then... Well, and then this morning... Well, I hope I was able to help you. Help me? Yes. What I told you. Does it help you? No, Miss Hastings. I'm afraid it doesn't help me at all. How can it help when you know that if you had accepted an old friend's invitation to breakfast, she might still be alive? How does it help to know when it's too late that both your lives might have been different? Was that stick-up merely a covering device for her deliberate murder? I'll return shortly with Act Two. You're on the open road, rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. mid-sized car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Your Century's comfortable, it's nimble, it's economical, and above all, it's a Buick. Living free. can make your blood pressure go up. And Madame Wish? Oh, uh, I'd like Pate to start, I think. Oui, Madame. And, Darling. uh, Lichy Soise. Darling. Chateaubriand? Yes, and Petit Soise. Darling. Yes, sir. I forgot my wallet. What, again? Oh, monsieur. Yes, your blood pressure can go up, but usually it will come back down again. If it doesn't, you may have hypertension. But hypertension can be controlled. Your heart association advises you to see your doctor regularly. May we? Remember back before those new car rebates started? Even then, your Chicagoland gallant men of olds were saving folks hundreds of dollars with the best trades and the best deals in town. Like the ones they're making right now on the all-new GMO, the car built especially for Chicagoland. From its Landau roof and opera windows to its bold pinstriping, dual sports windows, and super stock wheels, GMO, the comfortable mid-sized car with outstanding fuel economy, great maneuverability, and a lot more special styling and exclusive features than you may have thought possible at such a sensible price. And now with those big factory rebates like $500 on Starfire and $200 on any Omega delivered before February 28th, you'll find even more ways to save on a new Oldsmobile. Remember, you always get the best deals from your Chicagoland gallant men of olds. But you only have eight more days to get those big factory rebates. So see your Olds dealer right away. should turn on love and understanding. Instead, it seems to be spun by vanity and pride. So many people could prevent so many problems. Indeed, could alter the very shape and direction of their lives if they could only talk freely and openly and honestly at the right time. Ten years ago, obviously, Eleanor Brody and Bob Clifton couldn't do it. And today, she has been killed during what appeared to be a grocery store robbery. And he is the detective investigating the case. Sit down, Sergeant. I'm sorry to disturb you at a time like this, Mr. Crane. I uh, understand. You were Miss Brody's fiancée? Yes, I was. Tell me, uh, did she seem to be upset recently? Upset? Why should she be upset? Oh, uh, Sergeant, this is my uncle, J James Wainwright. I was told there was a police officer in the house. What can we do for you? I want to ask a few questions. Yeah? Why? Uncle Jim, uh, it should be obvious why. It isn't obvious to me. Besides, I didn't ask you. After all, what is there to ask? She was killed in a holdup, wasn't she? Well, officer, wasn't she? That's right. It was an unfortunate coincidence. Her past life had nothing to do with it. She would have been killed in any event. Therefore, the police have no reason to pry into the affairs of private citizens. Don't you agree, sir? Well, perhaps if it were just a holdup. What do you What do you mean, if? What else could it have been? A way of covering up her murder. You can't be serious. Oh, yes, I am. And that's why I'm here, to ask some questions. Well, how could we possibly help you? I don't know. Well, if this is a fishing expedition, you've come to the wrong stream. 
I will answer no questions unless my attorney is present. Uncle Jim, the man is just trying to do his That's job. That's enough out of you too, Lester. Mr. Wainwright, I'm investigating a murder. I need information on the background of Miss Brody. It's immaterial to me whether I get my answers here or down at headquarters. I don't like your attitude. I'll have you know the commissioner is an intimate friend of mine. Uncle, let's get this over with. All right, all right. Well, what do you want to know? Miss Brody, did she seem upset lately? Well... No. Not at all. Why do you ask? Her roommate says she was. Oh? Well, upset after all. You know women, they get nervous as their wedding day approaches. I don't mean that kind of nervous. I mean terrified. Well, yes, she might have been terrified. Of what? Of her uh, approaching responsibility. She was marrying very far above her station in life. Now, Uncle Jim, you shouldn't talk like that. Why not? It's true. She was a poor girl, and my company, which one day will be this young man's, has assets of $50 million. What is your company, sir? Wainwright Associates. What does Wainwright Associates do? Oh, you, you can't be serious. Oh, I'm sorry, we import textiles, all kinds of textiles from all over the world. Yes? And we sell them to various manufacturers. I see. And Miss Brody's position? She was a designer. We maintain a design service for many of our clients. Well, uh, that uh, should end the Inquisition. Tell me, would either of you be aware of a man with a very light complexion, almost no coloring at all? Uh, why do you, why do you ask? It's important to our investigation. No, no, I'm aware of no such person. Mr. Crane? No. I have a question. Yes? My nephew here, Lester Crane, he gave Miss Brody a great many gifts. Are they, um, are they recoverable? Uncle Jim, how can we talk about that now? These things have to be faced, Lester. Now, Sergeant, what procedure do we follow? Well, it seemed to me that your attorney could advise you. Those gifts were her property. They belonged to her estate. Well, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of things that belong to Wainwright and Company, some of designs and clothes, especially uh, a sweater that's a new model. You'd have to discuss that down at headquarters. Well, sir, uh, <clears throat> if you have no further questions... I have no further questions at this time. <laughs> Yeah, Captain Gordon. Yes, there may be a break on those murders. But so far, we got nothing to give out. Look, Charlie, things are rough all over. Well, Bobby, what have you got? Sore feet, Captain. Well, you did want to investigate some murders. Where are we? The roommate says she was scared stiff. Yeah, we had that yesterday. And old Wainwright says she was just normally nervous about getting married. And nobody cares what young Lester says because he doesn't count. Is that how it still adds up? So far. Now, how about Whitey? Whitey is safe and snug and warm in a rat hole somewhere. Well, he can't hide forever. I'll get him if it takes the rest of my life. That's no way for a smart cop to work. There can't be anything personal in it. This whole thing is personal. If I'd had breakfast with her, she'd still be alive. But what does that do to your theory? If she was marked, they would have gotten her another time. Yeah, homicide, Captain Gordon. Oh, Captain, this is Dr. Sparrow. Uh, there's a detective with you who's investigating that grocery store holdup. Oh, uh, yeah, Sergeant Clifton. Uh, hold on, Doctor. Bobby, it's uh, Dr. Sparrow at General Hospital. Sergeant Clifton. Oh, Sergeant, I know you people are very busy, and this is probably nothing. Well, let me judge that, Doctor. Well... I mean, on the face of it, I, I wouldn't even think that there's any significance. Well, you must have some reason for calling me. Well, you remember, Sergeant, when you were in the hospital and we were listening to the poor old Russian lady? She's no better, I'm afraid. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I remember we were saying how things were interrelated. Yes? And that Miss Brody had been in here a week before she died and was killed because of a severe skin irritation. Yes, I remember well, she has a roommate, uh, Miss Dora Hastings. Miss Hastings is here now with the same skin irritation. But does it mean anything? I mean, from a police point of view, or am I wasting your time? I'll be right there. <laughs> Actually, she came in last night. She's much better now. We've treated her. She can go home tomorrow. What caused it, Doctor? Well, it's a sweater. A sweater? Probably the most beautiful sweater I've ever seen. Such brilliant color, lovely design, but... But what? Well, there must be something in the dye. 
It seems to have a very strong alkali base. It can give a lot of trouble, especially to people with sensitive skin. Hello, Miss Hastings. Oh, am I in trouble with the law? Why should you be in trouble with the law? Uh, for taking the sweater. Well, I don't know anything about that. I've been punished enough. Take it back. Put it with all those things. I don't want it. Why don't you tell me about it? Well, I knew something would happen to me. What? I never stole anything in my life. So the first time I weakened. And what did I take? I didn't try to steal any of her jewelry or anything that was really valuable. I just took the sweater. The sweater? Well, who'd miss it or know anything about it? I couldn't resist it. It's so pretty. So look at what happens. My arms. Certain people, and I'm one of them, should never steal. Please, take it back to the apartment. All right, now you decided to take the sweater. I wore it when I went shopping and out to dinner. And then a couple of hours later, I felt as if my whole body were on fire. Say, that's what must have happened to Eleanor the night she had to come here. She'd worn the sweater, too. Are you sure? I'm positive. And where did she get the sweater? She brought it home from the office. It's one she designed. You mind if I take it? Please. <laughs> Hey, Bobby. There was a phone call for you. From whom? Well, it was about you. It seems that Wainwright had a court order to go to the Brody girl's place and pick up some designs that belong to the firm. So? Yeah, so they claim something's missing. What? The sweater. What kind of sweater? Come on, you know what kind of sweater. The sweater you were supposed to bring back from the hospital. The one that the roommate borrowed. That sweater? And where is it? In my locker? What kind of game are you playing, Bobby? If they want it back, I'll bring it back. Bobby, you're trying to pull a fast one, but this Wainwright has got a lot of clout. Why did they want the sweater? Because it's their property. Sure, but when I was at the house, the old man started this song and dance about recovering some gifts and stuff. It was all a cover. For what? For the sweater. Why would they want that sweater? Huh? From what I hear, it's already given two girls fits. Sure is a hard luck sweater. Yeah, still they want it and it belongs to them, so? So, I'll bring it back. Yeah. Bobby, do I know everything that's going on? No. You only know as much as I do. You personally hand deliver that sweater? Of course. I'd like to see Mr. Lester Crane. Police. Oh, wow. You don't look like a cop. No, why not? You're too cute. Uh, did you know Eleanor Brody, Miss, uh... Carter. Melba Carter. Miss Carter? Oh, sure. We, we both come here about the same week nine years ago. We both sat at the same desk. She went up. All the way up. She mm. even got the boss's nephew. Tell me, did she seem nervous lately? Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry to say I was so jealous of her, I couldn't really see straight. Oh, poor kid, what good did it do her? Did some man ever come around to see her, a man with a very light complexion? A guy? He? Mm. Oh, no. Why would she want to ruin the world's greatest setup? If there was a guy on the side, he was kept out of sight. Would you tell Mr. Crane that I'm here, please? Don't you want to ask me any more questions? Maybe later. <laughs> Thank you, Sergeant. It's a beautiful sweater. I've never seen such brilliant colors in the design. Yes, sir. Uh, well, it's... Uh, I'm sorry there uh, was this misunderstanding. I had intended to return it on my way to work. It's all right. Look, I, I want to apologize for my uncle. Uh, he, well, lives in a world of his own. I understand. He belongs to another time, another place. Mm -hmm. You were uh, Eleanor's fiance. W what did you say? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just thinking out loud... Yes, I, I was her fiancé, and, uh, well, I I owed her so much. You see, because of her, I I stood up to my uncle. He he was opposed to our getting married. Why? Why? <laughs> he wouldn't need a reason. He's so contrary. And, well, I, I always yielded to his judgment, but not this time. Yes? Mr. Crane, there's been an inquiry concerning... E-L-77? E-L-77? And you told me that... E-L-77? And you told me you'd handle everything there yourself, so 
Sergeant? Uh, p- uh, I've placed that call on hold, and I'll pick it up very soon. Uh, Sergeant, uh, is there anything else you uh, want to know? I, I have some very important things to do. No, no, I've taken up enough of your time. Goodbye, Mr. Crane. E.L. 77. Once again, a combination of letters and numbers. And what do they mean? One thing is certain. They have the power to make people nervous. First, Eleanor Brody. And now, Lester Crane. E.L. 77. A simple arrangement of innocent-looking letters and numbers. Well, any arrangement of letters and numbers can look innocent. Consider E equals MC squared. I'll be back, hopefully in just a few moments with Act Two. Give your hand to a man. Give your heart to your love. But give your courage to conquer. The the Six or three or one. That's the question when you catch the common cold. Then take 12 hour contact. You need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three cold pills, one every four hours, or just one contact capsule. For up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezing, congestion, drips. The tiny time pills do it. For aches and fever, the others contain aspirin. Contact doesn't. Your cold, your choice. Six or three or one. Give your cold to contact. The number one cold medicine in the whole world. Give your cold. Six or three or one. Take contact only as directed. Save a little and save a lot more at the Northwest Federal General Store. That's where you'll find a giant cracker barrel of gifts. Gifts for savers by famous makers we all know. The Sunbeam hand mixer, the Schick style dryer, a Presto pressure cooker and wearing blender... And they're all free or priced for special savings when you save $250 or more. See them all in our newspaper ads. And now you can save at three centers of interest in the great Northwest Territory, on Irving Park Road, on Dempster Street in Des Plaines, and now in Norwich in the Harlem Irving Plaza. So save where you get the highest interest rates allowed by law. And get free gifts, too, from the Cracker Barrel of Gifts, now at Northwest Federal Savings. But come in soon. Some styles and colors are limited. One gift per family, please. Offer good for a limited time only. Remember, it's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. The correct time, 11.08 exactly. It's 46 degrees at midway. Continued warm tonight, mostly cloudy. The overnight low about 40. Saturday, high about 42 degrees. As the poet said, the saddest words of tongue and pen are these. It might have been. Bob Clifton thinks of what might have been with Eleanor Brody. Ten years ago, they were too proud, too immature perhaps, to know how to make love endure. Now the only thing that Bob can do for Eleanor is try to bring her killer to justice. No, Bob! Why not? Because you can get into more trouble than you ever thought existed. Is that all you ever think about, getting into trouble? Besides, it's wrong. Why, Artie? Why is it wrong? Because, Bobby, you propose to use a human decoy. That girl can be killed. How? If we have it staked out. All we want him to do is show himself, then we bag him. On what charge? He's been identified as the killer in the grocery store holdup. How? And by whom? The old lady died last night. What you've got are the delirious mumblings on a tape recorder. Come on. A smart lawyer could kill it. He's got to do more than just show himself. He has to come after her. We have to prove intent to murder. What do you want? The smoking pistol? By then it's too late. Not the smoking pistol, but the pistol. He has to be caught in the act of trying to gun her down. And that's cutting it too close. Not if we have him covered. It's too risky. Too much can go wrong. It's the only way. Bobby, I don't want to hear any more about it. You don't have to do it, Miss Hastings. But I want to. It could be very dangerous. I don't care. It's the least I can do for Eleanor. I shouldn't ask you to do it either. It's just that I have to get that killer. I understand. 
Let me make a confession, Miss Hastings. You don't have to. I'm the man Eleanor spoke to last Friday. I knew that. You knew? How? Oh, woman's intuition, maybe. But you had to be the man. Do you want me to make that call now? Yes. And say exactly what I told you. Hello? Mr. Wainwright? Yes? Mr. Wainwright, I must talk with you. Who, who are you? I have certain information. What is this? Concerning EL-77. What? what? What did you say? You heard what I said. Well, uh, what, uh, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. Make me an offer. An offer? To do what? Well, not to go to the police, for instance. Oh. Oh, I see. Is that how it is? Yes, that's how it is. Well, uh, let me, uh, let me think about it. You don't have any time. I'm leaving the country tonight. I'd like to travel first class, if you know what I mean. See you in an hour? Could you make that two hours? But no longer. And, uh, the address? 18 Stevens Court. It sounds familiar. It should. I'm her roommate. <laughs> Anyone moving up the street? Not yet. Are you sure this is the only entrance to the building? Yes, he couldn't get in any other way. All right. He has to come up the street. Walk in the front door. Come up the stairs, knock on your door. Now, don't stand near the doorway. He might shoot through it. Leave the door unlocked. When he knocks, you say, come in, it's open. When he walks in, I'll be ready for him and keep out of sight. Look, down the street, is that someone coming? Stand by the side of the window. If that's our boy, don't let him see you. Well, I know Mr. Wainwright. It isn't him. No, it wouldn't be Mr. Wainwright. It would be an employee of his. I can't see too well in this dark, but I'm sure that it's... It's who? The man who killed Eleanor. Oh, it's so quiet. You can almost hear his footsteps. Wait. There are men getting out of those cars. Look. Hold it, Whitey! Please! <laughs> What are you doing here? What am I doing here? I had the place staked out. Why? To save your neck. I knew you'd try to get Whitey to show himself. I wasn't going to let him come up to the apartment. But you've killed him. How can we tie him to Wainwright? Bobby, it was the only thing we could do. Well, hello. Oh, oh you're the cop who called on Mr. Crane. The cute one. If everything squared away? Yes, I guess so. I, I was headed for your office. Well, so am I. Look, maybe you could do something for me. Well, why not? Uh, this is a package of some papers that we found in Miss Brody's apartment. Now, some of them look like business things, and we want to return them to the company. Could you save me the trip? Okay. It's a nice day for a walk, though, isn't it? I don't even know if they're important, but I figured perhaps... Uh, what's the average cop do on his day off? Uh, some of them are just notes. And there's a number that I notice. It says EL-77. What does EL-77 mean? <laughs> Oh, 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 it's a lot number. A lot? Yeah, it would mean a European lot EL, and the number 77 means 7.7 7 million yards. That's quite a number of yards. Yeah, pretty good size, even for us. It's a, a hush-hush thing. What do you mean? I don't know. The only people who know anything about it are Lester Crane and the old man. Well, where is it? Where? The warehouse, I guess. Hey... Do you work every day in the week? Look, thank you very much, and uh, this is a favor. Bye. Hey, 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 come back here. You forgot... <sighs> he wants me to deliver a package, and he forgets to give me the package. Some cop. <laughs> Cute, though. I'm sorry to bother you again, Doctor. Oh, it's all right. That sweater, the one Miss Hastings wore... And we know now that Miss Brody wore it, too. You said something about the dye. Yes, I sent a few strands to the lab. We have a very extensive allergy clinic here. It's a very good wool. But I'm afraid it's ruined for any kind of wear. Why? The dye. It's a strange one, probably foreign. 
It isn't any of the known dyes used here. It's a very strong alkali content. If the manufacturer knew the dye had such a strong irritant quality, why would he use it? Well, yeah, maybe he didn't know, or maybe he thought he could get away with it. Doctor, suppose you knew where a whole lot of this material was. What would happen to it? Oh, I'm sure it could be condemned. Any federal, state, or city health department or Bureau of Standards would take it right off the market. Thank you, Doctor. Do you think this sweater has to do with those murders? I don't mind telling you, Sergeant, I'm not in the habit of receiving the police at this hour of the night. I'm here on official business, Mr. Wainwright. Indeed. Well, then why not conduct it during business hours? I have here a few strands of a wool material. Where did you get that? From a certain sweater. <laughs> well, what's that to me? This sweater was a sample... It was to be duplicated and sent out to Wainwright customers to show the brilliant colors that were a part of a certain imported lot. How dare you pry into the business of my company? European lot 77. The dye in it makes the material unfit for human clothing. That is a lie. Is it? If inspectors were to examine lot number 77 in your warehouse, Mr. Wainwright, what would happen? Excuse me, I, uh, I have a document here in my desk which will explain everything. See now. Oh, yes, here it is. All right, put up your hands. No, don't reach for your gun. You can't get away with it. Well, me. I'll just have to. Uncle Jim, what do you do? Uh, Lester, he has a gun in his belt holster. Reach around. Get it. I warn you, Sergeant. Don't try anything. But Uncle, just you do can't... as I tell you. Want to go bankrupt and in jail? That's it. That's it. Just, just remove it. Now hold on to that gun. Well, what, what are you going to do with him? Kill him. Oh, no! You... I just explained the alternative. That's right, Lester. He has to kill me just as he killed Eleanor. What? What are you talking about? Oh, he didn't kill her. He hired a thug to do it. No, she was killed in a, a, a holdup. In what looked like a holdup. You see, she knew about EL-77, too, and she wanted... That's enough. She wanted you to destroy it. I, I know, I know, but... But how, how could we do that, huh? We had... We would have lost millions. She said she'd go to the police, didn't she? No, no. No, she only said she'd break the engagement. But your uncle could... Lester, have... Lester, we're wasting time. You can't keep killing people, Mr. Wainwright. Uncle Jim, there can't be any killing. There's already been killing. Your uncle had Eleanor murdered. Don't listen to him. Sergeant, we... Look, we have to get rid of that cloth. It's wrong, I know, but if we don't, we'll go broke. Eleanor couldn't understand that, so she... She walked out on me, but she would have come back... Afterward, except that well, she was killed in that store. No. Wainwright killed her. He knew she'd turn you in. Don't you see what he's trying to do? What? Why do we have to kill him? What else is there? Why can't we have an understanding? Sergeant, there's a way out of this. There, there must be. No. The only way is for me to take Mr. Wainwright and book him for the murder of Eleanor Brody. And you're going to let him do that? I can't. Yeah. Go ahead, Lester. Ask him. Ask him if he killed her. Uncle... Did you... What else could be done, you fool? We'd have all gone to the jailhouse first and the poorhouse second. Did you kill her? Yes, yes, I killed her. I hired a man to kill her. I had to. You weren't man enough to kill her yourself. You killed her! Lester! <laughs> My uncle? <laughs> I'm afraid he's dead. I hope... <laughs> I hope I die, too. I'll call an ambulance. Please, please. I have to tell you this first. I, I just shot him to, to prove something to you. To me? <laughs> Why? Because she told me everything about her past. That she'd always be in love with a man named Bobby Clifton. <laughs> That's you, isn't it? Yes, that's me. Well, you see, I killed him because she she finally made a man out of me. She taught me how to stand up to him, and I did. I did. Didn't I, Bobby? Yes. Yes, Lester. You did. <laughs> man is dead. The nephew recovered. Lot EL-77 was destroyed. 
It would be nice to report that Bobby married Dora Hastings and Lester married Melba, but we're not in business to tie up neat little packages. All we have done is open up the book of someone's life, glanced at a page, and returned it to the shelf. As I shall be returned to you in just a few moments. Here is an important message from Buick. Buick wants you to know that a cash rebate of $500 will be given to everyone who takes delivery of a new Buick Skyhawk by February 28, 1975. And a rebate of $200 will be given to everyone who takes delivery of a Buick Skylark or Apollo by February 28th. Buick's cash rebate program is just one of many reasons for buying a free-spirited 1975 Buick Skyhawk, Skylark, or Apollo. So see your Buick dealer. Boy, do I have a headache. Why do they have to make these caps so hard to open? For a very good reason. Children open things that they shouldn't. That's why we have safety packaging. For the life of your child, you can live with a little inconvenience. For further information, write the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, Washington, D.C., 20207. It is written, every man is a weaver, and on his loom he weaves his life. But the colors and the design are not created by the skill of his hands. Rather, do they spring forth from the beauty of his heart. We are also weavers, weavers of spells. And we hope you will join us seven times each week and enjoy our designs. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Bob Caliban, Joe Silver, Bryna Rayburn, and Catherine Byers. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. They're hiding in a cave. A cave? You must do better than that, my dear. You, uh, you pick up the pathway just past our house. And you follow it north for two miles. Now you come to a deep ravine. In front of you is... is what looks like a wall of solid rock. But it isn't. No. Because when you climb to the top of it, you will see the entrance to the cave. Thank you. Sergeant, place her under arrest. But, but you said... I you... said you'd be rewarded. <gasps> At this point, I don't know how. If you're lying, a firing squad will give you 30 leaden bullets. If you're truthful, there. There are 30 silver krona. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. The time is 11:24 on a Friday night. That's the end of a mystery show. I hope nobody swoons. So long, folks. It's time to go. A thank God day in two. We'll be back by and by with more of radio's best. A tale to terrify I'll give you party and the rest We guarantee our story Will send chills right up your spine Just make sure that you're the one Who chills the bean your wine But for now, turn on the light And open up the light Hope we didn't leave you in a fright Or in a state of shock We'll be back with more suspense your hair turned gray, brought to you with compliments.
This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare, Espionage International Intrigue, these are the weapons of the OSS. Today's story, The Roof of the World, concerning two American agents who travel into the far-off and mysterious land of Tibet on a secret pilgrimage, is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services, a story that can now be told. It came at us suddenly, out of the darkness. A shaggy monster over 15 feet high. None of us said a word for a minute. We just stared at it. The tusks. Look at the length of them. The tusks of this monster must have been at least 12 feet long. And I knew myself that if I hadn't seen it, stood right in front of it, I wouldn't have believed it actually existed either. But I saw it. There was definite proof. It did live. Once. Okay, okay, lights. Put on the lights, please. All right now, quiet please, quiet. What you have just seen is the last of our afternoon slides here in the Museum of Natural History on prehistoric animals. This last mammoth was a species of a true elephant which was found in Tibet during and before the Ice Age. Now, are there any questions? Yeah, how do you get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'll all follow the guide, he'll take you into the next room where you can actually see the skeletons of these monsters, which paleontologists have reconstructed from fossils and actual bones discovered in the earth. Philip? Oh, Phil. Oh, hello, Esther. Were you here for the whole lecture? No, just the last part of it. But you were sensational. <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere. Uh, what's that? Oh, telegram. Here. Just came to the office. Thanks. Oh, it's not for me, it's for us. Oh, who's it from? Washington. The Office of Strategic Services wants to see us. Office of Strategic... Now, why in the world do they want us? Well, there's one way to find out. Mr. and Mrs. Malden, we know your reputation as geologists and explorers... We know you've traveled the Far East together several times. That's true, Colonel. Now, at this stage of the war, Germany is pushing eastward across Africa to Suez, and Japan is thrusting westward across China into India. If the Axis partners meet, their junction will be Central Asia, and dominating that meeting point will be Tibet. What do you want us to do, Colonel? We want volunteers to make a pilgrimage to the Dalai Lama, high priest of Tibet, It'll be a goodwill mission to get them on our side. It involves a great deal of danger. Yes, yes, we know. Esther? <laughs> well, as long as you're sure that mammoth elephant disappeared from there centuries ago, I'm willing. A few 
weeks later, we were flown to India where we were given a car. Then the tour was started out across the border to a village called Gyuksam at the foot of the Himalaya Mountains. Once there, we were to pick up pack animals and a guide and start our journey to the holy city. Well, these roads couldn't have been any narrower or any rockier. Well, they weren't designed for modern travel. You can say that again. Phil. Hmm? Are you worried about something? I'm worried about a lot of things. For instance? For instance, this is the worst possible time of the year to be traveling up that mountain. It's almost spring up there, and the thaw is setting in. It's going to loosen the snow and ice all along the way. Well, we'll just have to be more careful, that's all. Hmm. Oh, Phil, look, round the bend of the road. That's the village, isn't it? That's it. That's it. Wait a minute, Phil. Slow down. Look. Good Lord. I should have said it was a village. Burned to the ground. The old man who sat wailing and moaning, cross-legged on the ground, was the only one left alive in that village. Bandri tribe come from mountains, steal, kill, set fire to village. How is it they spared you? I am priest sent from Dalai Rama to this village many years past. If they kill hoary man, great prig and pestilence will be upon them. Well, tell me, where'd you learn to speak English? In hoary city was taught. Well, what do we do now, Phil? We can't leave him here alone. We'll take him with us and drive until we find another village. Oh, no, no. I take you. Huh? What's that? A sing to will be guide to Hori City. Here are is lost. Go back to Dalai Lama. What about pack animals? A village of Chomda, not far away. We'll go there first. Chanda was about ten miles away down the road. It was small, with only a few huts made of sun-dried bricks. Phil was afraid of the spring thaw that was setting in more every day, so we made arrangements with the native chief to start almost immediately. What do you say, St. Thomas? Kiang's wild donkeys as good pack animals as other white men has. Oh. What's he talking about? What other white men? Ask him. Acquired and who? Pango Sulibra. Joa Sodi. Lasa. A strangers leave here two days ago on way also to holy city of Rasa. Wear batch with crooked cross. Phil. Nazis. We're in a race, Esther. We've got to reach Lasa before they do. That was the first we knew that the Germans were ahead of us, going in the same direction, on the same mission. Philip was right. It was going to be a race for time. Esther, come on. This is no time to pick flowers. Oh, look at this dwarf rhododendron, Phil. And up ahead, it's like a carpet of blue irises. Yeah, there'll be plenty of foliage until we cross the timber line. Then it'll just be cold. And traveling on snow is going to be a lot tougher. Well, I'm not looking forward to the temperature dropping 100 degrees in 20 miles. It... Oh, oh. Uh oh Watch it. Did you hurt yourself? No, I just tripped. I guess I must be getting tired. Is it sing too? Yes, Mrs. Yes. How soon will we be able to camp? Cold springs less than half a mile ahead. We'll camp there for night. <laughs> When we reached the springs, I started dinner out of K rations, which kept our packs light. And by the time I was through, the tent had mushroomed up, and Phil and Sing Tu were inside, straightening the pole and fixing the blankets for the night. How about food, Esther? Uh -huh. Soup's on. Vegetable. Mala. I looked up from the fire to find an unpleasant surprise. Six unpleasant surprises, carrying rifles and forming a ring of muddy boots all around me. Who are you, men? What do you want? Lala. Lala. Phil! What is it? They do! Where'd they come from? I don't know. They're just here, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Sing to? 
This awesome of nomad band to rate my brooch. Niga, Shemo. What do they want? Kadia, Kadia. Good answer, bang, thank you, Kadia. They say they take surprise everything against to. Goya, Theo, so lovely. Leader, shoot off gun to show you he mean what he say. Oh, Phil, without our supplies and guns, we'll have to turn back. Providing they let us turn back. Nothing, why am I? They hold you hostage. Send me, hoary man, back to get ransom. Oh, Phil. Hold on, hold on. Don't let them know you're afraid of them. We stood there while they gathered our supplies out of the tent and threw them in a heap by the fire. Sing, too, knew he wouldn't be harmed because he was a holy man. But Phil and I had no idea what was ahead for us. Get your hands off me, you baboon! Oh, Phil! Leave her alone, you understand? Sing, too. Tell them we'll come quietly. Go up! Falling! I said, get your filthy hands off me! The machine gun that riddled the bandit leader came from the direction of the brush. And the six of them went down, one after another. Then there was silence. And we looked up to see our two saviors walking out of the brush in German uniform. I'm delighted that we were able to be of assistance, Americans. I am Commandant Kurt Farber of the German army. This is Lieutenant Ernst Kessler. Freut mich. Oh, thank you for saving our lives. I'm, I'm Esther Malden, and this is my husband, Philip. Oh, and our guards sing too. You do not seem uh, too surprised to uh, see us here. We are not. Just surprised you're not two days ahead of us the way we thought you were. Then you knew about us? How? They told us in the village. They also told us you were headed for the holy city. They talk too much, those native idiots. The clinic does mal hunt. Crash their ants. And um, you, um, are you also going there? No. Oh, I mean... Oh, we're, we're geologists. We're just on an exploring expedition. <laughs> come, come. Is it quite nice to lie to your benefactors who have just saved your lives? I don't get that. Why did you? Well, we saw the American flag sewn on your clothing. That told us immediately who you were and where you were going. We, as you already know, we are also headed for Lhasa to the Dalai Lama. But our guide was killed. The snow loosened under him as we turned the ledge and he uh, fell. So you were going back for a guide? Exactly. But that is some distance away. Time is slipping by. You have the guide. You will lead us. Oh, no, we won't. And neither will Sing too. Will you Sing too? We'll do only as friend Americans tell me. The flukter hood! Ah, Ernst, you get too excited over nothing. Now remember, Herr Morden, Frau Morden, you have the guide... We have your supplies and your weapons. Let us pool our resources. Go together. If you think that at the point of our own guns you're going to make us lead you to Lhasa, you're crazy. Look, you are scientists. I appeal to your logical minds. Is it not safer that since we are traveling the same direction, we travel together? Once we reach the Dalai Lama, that each of us present the case of his country to him. If you'll forgive me for repeating, Herr Commandant. We're not going to be pushed along with guns in our backs. <laughs> nein, nein. <laughs> Who said you would be? Here. Why, Phil, he's giving us back our pistols. You see? We trust strangers, gentlemen? No. Not yet. It's all right. Go ahead, open them. Yeah, open the gun if you like. Go ahead, spin the drum. See the cartridges in the chamber. Yes. Yes, I see them. Well, we return your guns, loaded as they were. Now shall we forget the war for a while and travel on together? Okay. Let's try it. Oh, we're lagging behind them, Phil. Shouldn't we catch up to them? We will. I want to talk to you. Ooh, I'm, I'm cold. A temperature went down so fast once we crossed the timber line, I could almost hear it drop. Oh. What do you think of this situation? With our friends? I don't know what to think. 
Do you trust them? Of course I don't. Whether they gave us back our guns or not, they're still going to look for a chance to double-cross us before we reach the Holy City. What are we going to do, Phil? Just keep an eye out. Look for a way to double-cross them first. French, French, clear brook, he here. Good water to drink. Come. Come, my friends. You hear what he says? Water. <laughs> that will taste better than the whiskey in your flask, eh, Ernst? We're coming. <laughs> We caught up with them, and as we leaned over to fill our canteens from the small, clear brook, there was a sudden rumbling. Ah, the water's turned muddy suddenly. Yeah, it's covered with a dirty foam. I think, too. Ren. What's he talking about? It is not raining. It is in the high regions. That's what turned the water. But so suddenly. It happens like that. Races along under the ground, pushing the mud with it. It's, It's really beginning to thaw, isn't it? Yes, that's what I was afraid of. What is there to be afraid of? Answer me! As the snow starts to melt, it'll start to fall. So just watch your step. <laughs> Ernst, is it not good to have three such good guides? <laughs> we are indeed fortunate, was? <laughs> Come, my brook, along the way, we walk. Walk? Why do you think we have these animals? Kiang can be turned loose here. We'll get more and more snow. It's best to climb by foot. Yes, Sing Tu's right. Besides, the animals won't find any place to graze. It's been getting pretty sparse for miles. Mm, where will they go? They are wild. We'll find no own way. Hera! Hera! The packs were heavy, and we were too tired the next two days to do much talking. We just watched each other. The jagged paths under us were getting more and more slippery. And below the cliff, we could see a sheer drop of hundreds of feet to the glacier. Above us were the snow peaks. And somewhere beyond, the holy city of Lhasa, towards which small birds of dull brown, gray, and black seemed to point. And then, the third night after the strange pact had been made between our two enemy camps, it happened. Esther, where are you going? Oh, to the brook around the bend, Phil. I want to get some water. You take care of the rest. Uh, if you pitch the tent, Her Morgan, I'll fix the fire. Oh, by the way, where's Elm? Oh, there it is. I knew I'd seen a brook. Oh, ain't just a little bigger hole in the ice. Oh, there. Huh. Come on, let me carry that back for you. Lieutenant Kessler, what are you doing here? I can see you don't want to be friendly. What a pity. I'll be friendly enough to give you some good advice. No. Save that liquor until you really need it. And stop guzzling it if you intend to keep up on this hike. This is no Boy Scout picnic. <laughs> I'm touched by your concern for me. Don't flatter yourself. What are you doing back here anyway? You really wish to know. I followed you. I knew you were coming to the brook. So I went round the other way. You what? You don't like me. You'd like me very much if you got to know me. No, thanks. Now, please, get out of my way and let me go back. (laughs) But, Kleiner, we may not have another chance to be together alone. You're very attractive. Even in those heavy clothes. Yeah, I know. Very attractive. Besides, I'm the only woman for miles. Now get out of my way. Uh-huh. I would like to see you in the white gown. The diamond clips at your shoulders. Have you got nice shoulders from yes. more Let me alone. Don't try to pull away Stop from it. me. Stop it, you drunken kiss. fool. Just one kiss. Oh, you big dumb drunken Nazi pig. You watch your tongue. Get out of from me. Let's run him! Cut it out of you, do not! Stop yelling, I say! Stop it! Stop it! Get away, Kessler! Get away, leave her alone. And if I don't, you gave me back my gun, I'll use it. (laughs) You have your gun? You would not dare shoot me. Go on, try it, use your gun. Ernst, that is enough. Get up, strong enough. Where's the trunk, you idiot? Do you want him to use his gun on you? Think, Ernst, do you want him to use this gun? He will. I can tell you, Will. Uh, no, no. 
I give this lady your apologies. I order you. My apologies, Frau Morlin. You both have my word an incident like this will not occur again. Shall we eat and make camp for the night now? All the next day, Phil and Sing Too kept me between them as we climbed. I wondered how soon we'd see the holy city and when all this would come to a head. Look! When Sing Too yelled, we turned around and looked in the direction from which we'd just come. A huge ice pillar swayed for a moment, and then... It, it landed on the path we had come from less than two hours before. Well, this is what we can expect from now on, now that the thaw's set in. Oh, well, I'll expect it, but I won't look forward to it. Mistaken, or are the days getting longer? Sleepy. Uh huh. You know, it was nice of them to let you and Sing Tu and me have this cave to ourselves. Well, considering that it's too small to hold more than three of us, it wasn't so magnanimous. Still, they could have tried to grab it for themselves. Farber seems to be trying to make amends for the way his pal liked it the other day. I wonder what their game is. Yes, I'd like to know too. Sing Tu. Yes. You wish to know how soon we reach Hore City? <laughs> he may not talk much, but he's a pretty good mind reader. Shh. That's it, Sing Too. How long? Expect to see gates in distance, perhaps tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, that's wonderful. Is it? Well, isn't it? It means time has run out, Esther. If they're going to pull anything, they're going to pull it now. The Germans were camped under a ledge which protected them from the wind about 50 feet from us across a narrow crevasse. In spite of all the things that had happened before or might be going to happen ahead, it was strangely peaceful up there. In the west, a fan of pink rays from the sun shot up from behind the snow range and overhead a few bright stars twinkled. Presently, the fan flickered and, and, and disappeared. And then... In the glow of the full moon, I saw what looked like a long procession of ghosts in the distance, but were actually cascades of snow, melting and falling hundreds of feet, leaping from ledge to ledge. In the morning, the air was crystal clear, and we saw it. The holy city. <laughs> Esther, do you see it? I expected only to return again when I die. Oh, it, it's beautiful. How long will it take us to reach it? You will not reach it at all, my friends. Don't start something you can't finish, Herr Commandant. Phil. Get back, get behind me, back in the cave. You should have been more friendly to me, Frau Morley. Perhaps I would have taken you with us. Uh, go on, throw your gun, shoot us. <laughs> go ahead. Watch the big joke. <laughs> Do you think we would have been fools enough to give you loaded guns? <laughs> but I saw them. I broke open the gun and saw the cartridges. Did you take one out and examine it? Why don't you do it now? Phil, look, I, I opened mine. It's a... It's a blank cartridge. Now, surely, Frau Morden, you understand why I took care not to let your husband become too excited the night Ernst here tried to be friendly. I didn't want to take a chance of your finding out too soon. We shall give you regards to the Dalai Lama. Ah, oh, shoot us. Go on. Kill us with your blank guns, if you can. That's not a bad idea. Esther. Elf, look out! Back in the cave, quick. Phil took them at their word and actually killed them with his blank gun. 
The shots vibrated enough to loosen the heavily piled snow, break the crust at the rim of the ledge, and start the slide that avalanche down the surface. It threw them over the side and buried them somewhere on the cliffs below us, under rock, ice, and snow. Gone. They are gone. Oh, the, the thaw worked for us, didn't it? Yes. Come on, Singto. You lead. We'll follow. We could see the holy city, but it was still 25 miles away. It was two days' travel of an almost vertical descent into the valley. And we arrived at dusk at the magnificent red and white palace that overlooked the city. It was a week before we saw the Dalai Lama. Our entrance into his presence was conducted with the utmost ceremony. Tall, grim-faced monks lined the hall. Their six-foot-four-inch frames made even more massive by layers of stiff gold brocade. The walls were carved with strange images and Tibetan inscriptions. Then the gong was struck again. We were ushered into the throne room. Esther, look. Quiet. Must not talk. Come. Dalai Dama will see you now. We walked on thick rugs that were brilliant in color and depicted the waves of the sea, clouds, and emblems of happiness. Then we saw a throne of yellow satin at the end of the great room, and on it, robed in burgundy and gold satin, with a crown on his head and a table of jewels beside him, sat the Dalai Lama, a boy of six. Come closer. Come. I will throw the silk longevity scarf over your heads to welcome you. We thank you for your welcome, Your Serenity. We bring you gifts from our leader. I accept your gifts with great thanks. How is your president? He is well, thank you. Bring the gifts to me. Let me see. They gave him the gifts, and he looked at each one carefully. After a while, servants began to pass bowls of rice and glasses of black tea. I noticed that a special taster took a sip of the Lama's tea before it touched his sacred lips. Mr. and Mrs. Malden? Yes, Your Serenity? Throw a pinch of rice over your shoulder. It will bring good luck. Your Serenity, we've come to talk about peace and friendliness between our two countries. There is no need to talk. Come here. I tie three knots in your scarf. There. What's that? Sing to Means only interview at an end. But we've accomplished nothing. His serenity has tied three knots in American's longevity scarf. He has blessed them. Our countries will be friends. The success of the mission of these two OSS geologists helped to lay the foundations of friendship between Tibet and the United States and to forestall any possibility of Tibet's cooperation with our Axis enemies. Thus, once again, the report of another agent ends with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Esther was Louise Barclay, Philip, Grant Richards, the monk, Raymond Edward Johnson... Barber, Stephen Schnabel, Kessler, Barry Kroger. Others were Janice Gilbert, Carl Weber, Ralph Bell, and Jerry Jarrett. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of John Garth. Sound effects by Chet Hill and Dick Gillespie. 
Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Am I disturbing you? I hope not. I don't mean to intrude. I just dropped in for half an hour with a story. It's not an ordinary story, and yet it might easily happen to someone you know. Someone you may have heard of. In any case, I'm pretty certain you'll be glad you listened. But perhaps I'd better introduce myself again, although we have met before. You don't remember? <laughs> oh, come now. We're old friends. You must have seen my face on your wrist, in your pocket, or on that steeple over there where I suppose I have more dignity but much less fun. Yes, we've met before, and we'll meet again, I'm sure of that. You see, I get around. Sooner or later, I run into everyone. Sooner or later, everyone runs into me. But I was telling you about my story, which has to do with Jeannie Clare. Jeannie's a pretty girl of 23 and rather nice. She had a birthday just a month ago, and it was a very happy affair. Some of the girls who worked with Jeannie at Kane's department store threw the party, and they all had a wonderful time, but that was a month ago. And things are different now. Precinct police stations are not exactly pleasant places, especially for girls like Jeannie Clare. The desk sergeant's always impersonal and efficient, but sometimes even efficiency can be a frightening thing. How long will it take, Sergeant? Oh, about 20 minutes. As long as it takes him to get down and back. 20 minutes? Mm, 20 minutes. In the meantime, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Now, Jeannie Clare, 1148 Stemina. Is that right? That's right. Now, what's your age? 23. Blue eyes... Brown hair. Hi. Five feet two. Wait. One hundred and ten pounds without my shoes. Mm hmm. One hundred and ten. Married? No. No, I'm not married. Mm. Occupation? Occupation. Yeah, well, where, where do you work? At Kane's department store. I sell gloves, men's gloves. That's where it started. At Kane's. Yes, that's where it started. At Kane's. It had been a long, long afternoon behind the counter, and the girls were glad to hear the closing bell. Oh, saved by the bell. I was just ready to pass out with exhaustion. Oh, my feet are killing me, Jeannie. You make out your sales tally, Ethel. Oh, you think I got eight hands like an octopus? Oh, I'm just starting now, and I better hurry. I got a date with Harry. Huh? Oh? Well, uh, you, you want to come along? With you and Harry? Yeah, he could get another guy. Oh, thanks, Ethel, but not tonight. Say, what goes with you? Don't you ever want to have any fun? I like my fun, same as anyone else. Only, well, not tonight, that's all. Not tonight, not tomorrow night, not next month. What are you waiting for, the perfect man? Maybe. Ah, oh, there ain't no such animal. Oh, but you can't be too particular, Jeannie, unless you want to sell gloves for old man Martin for the rest of your life. Just take Harry, for instance. He's no Van Johnson, but he's got his points. Harry's nice. 
but he's not my type. Now, who is your type, that Johnson dream? I'm not interested so much in look as I am in character. I want to marry a man, Ethel, a human being, not a collar ad. Oh, what do you think Harry is, a horse? Oh, you don't know what I mean. You see, Ethel, I never had much education. So my man's got to be smart. He's got to have manners, too, smart manners, like they have in France. He won't look silly, for instance, when he kisses my hand. <laughs> what else? He'll dress in taste. Not like a clothes horse, but like a gentleman. He'll be interested in good books and classical music. He'll take me to the art galleries and explain what the pictures mean. And when he talks, his voice will be soft and gentle. And clever, like a man of the world. I beg your pardon? Uh, what? Uh, may I see those gloves, please? They're on the first shelf. I'm sorry, mister. The store's closed. Oh, that's too bad. It's, it's all right, Ethel. I'll open up my book again and, and take care of the gentleman. No, it's your time. <laughs> that's awfully kind of you. I, I hope I'm not putting you to too much trouble. No. No trouble at all. Is something wrong? Uh, wrong? The way you stare at me. My tie... Oh, not... excuse me, I... I was just thinking of something. <laughs> Are these the gloves you mean? Uh, yes, please. Seven ninety-eight plus tax. Right, they're extremely smart. Yeah, they're good looking, all right. What is your size? Eight and a half. These ought to fit. May I try them on? Oh, sure. And take your time. I'm in no hurry. I'm in no hurry at all. Jeannie could hardly believe it. There he was, the man she'd always dreamed about, standing right in front of her. He wasn't handsome, but he was tall, and his clothes were neat. Jeannie always used to think a derby hat was rather silly on a man, but on this one, it was different. Everything seemed so different about him. And his voice. Well, when Jeannie heard his voice, the picture was complete. And what a wonderful picture it was. But then Jeannie remembered that he'd buy his gloves, he'd pay for them, and she'd never see him again. She tried to think of something to say to keep him there. But he only smiled politely, made his purchase, and walked away. And Jeannie felt she was watching him walk right out of her life. Jeannie! Huh? Hey, what are you dreaming about? I... Nothing. Did you make the sale? Yeah. Yeah, I made the sale. Hey, look! He forgot his wallet. His wallet? Yeah, on the counter over here. Oh, I'll take care of it. Give it to me. Hey, hey, what's your hurry? Uh, see if it's got any identification. Well, well, there's a card in here and a license. Mm -hmm. His name is Courtney. Keith Courtney. Huh? Pretty fancy. You better turn that over to the section manager. Oh, it's all right, Ethel. I can handle it. Why? Oh, just to make sure he gets it, I'll, uh, I'll deliver it myself. The young man's address was in the 40s, a small hotel. Not an elegant place, Jeannie thought, but dignified. She waited in the lobby while the desk clerk called his room. It only took him two minutes to come down, but sometimes two short minutes can seem like two long years. Good evening. You you remember me? <laughs> of course. You are the charming young lady who waited on me in the store. <laughs> You're kind of absent-minded, aren't you? I am. You left this wallet on the counter. M Oh. oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I thought I'd lost it. You know, that's happened to me once before. I really should be more careful. You really should. There wasn't much money in it, but uh, there were the pictures. Of my family, you see. I would have hated to lose those snapshots. Well, you got them back now. So I guess I'll go... Uh, no, just, just a minute, please. You, you've gone to a great deal of trouble to return this to me. Oh, that's all right. When one returns a wallet, there's usually a reward. Well, in this case, we might reverse the procedure. I don't get it. I'd read the reward myself if you'd have dinner with me. Or have you made a previous appointment? Oh, no, I... I haven't got anything much to do. Then you'll accept? Oh, Sure. I mean, how oh, sure. He took Jeannie to a little Italian place on 46th. But Jeannie could hardly think of food. She just kept listening to his voice and watching him smile as he told her all about himself and about his work. 
He wanted to be an actor, or, oh, ever since he could remember. And he was looking for a break. He didn't want to be a movie star and make a lot of money. Shakespeare and Ibsen were more his style. He said right now he wasn't working. He was at liberty and available for the right part. Jeannie crossed her fingers and hoped that he was at liberty and available for the right girl. After dinner, they took a walk. And Jeannie noticed how he always tried to keep on her left or right, whichever was nearest to the street. Other men she'd met were never quite so thoughtful. But then Keith wasn't like other men. And Jeannie knew that from the moment she saw him. Jeannie? Yes, Keith? It's been a wonderful evening. Yes. You know, somehow it's been perfect. Nothing has spoiled it. For me. Or for me. Jeannie, may I see you again? You... You really want to? Very much. All right. <laughs> Tomorrow night? Oh, that's kind of soon, isn't it? Too soon for you? No. It's not too soon for me. Then we have a date. Tomorrow night and... I hope for many nights to come. For many nights to come. That sounded wonderful to Jeannie Clare. It sounded like forever... But she didn't know that forever could be a very short time. Jeannie saw him every night for four weeks in a row. They went everywhere together, to interesting places, to museums and art shows, a concert or two. Every once in a while, the theater. Not a moving picture. The theater. The legitimate stage, as Keith put it. Well, when you've never been in love before and you meet the perfect man, you don't have to think very hard to find out where you stand. After a while, Jeannie stopped telling herself to be sensible and to wait. She was crazy about him, that was that. And then one day he got a job. He wanted to celebrate and treat Jeannie to something special. They had dinner and danced a lot, then took the subway home. Jeannie, I've got something to tell you. Really, Keith? First of all, let me say that you're the nicest girl I ever met in my life. And you understand me more than anyone else I've ever known. Jeannie, I haven't let our relationship get too personal up to now because... Well, somehow I felt I didn't have a right to. You shouldn't have felt like that. Oh, well. well it was mostly money, I guess. I, uh, I didn't have very much saved up. And an actor never knows when he's going to get another job. But you've got one now. Yeah. Oh, Jeannie, it's a wonderful part. You know, if this play clicks... Well, when and if that happens, Jeannie, I'll have something more to tell you. You uh, couldn't tell me now? Uh, 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 no, not just yet. But if you want to... You can guess, and you'll probably be right. I, I think I know, Keith. And, and I'm very glad. You know, sometimes I think I'm a very lucky girl, Keith. Why? Well, things happen if you wait for them long enough, and, and the things that happen are usually nice. <laughs> Not like that poor kid or whoever she was. What poor kid? See the paper that man is reading across the aisle? Oh, yeah? Look what that headline says. Young girl slain by maniac. Isn't it awful? Horrible. Maybe it's selfish of me to say so. But I'm sure glad things like that only happen to other people. And I only have to read about them in the papers. I'm sure glad only nice things happen to me. When Keith said goodnight at the door, he bent down and kissed Jeannie's hand. And Jeannie seemed to know even before he did it that that was just the thing he'd do. When she got inside her room, she was much too excited to sleep. So she tried to read a while, and she opened the paper Keith had bought her as he left the subway. Then Jeannie saw that headline again. It gave a full description of the murder and where the victim was found. The girl was 24 and pretty. She'd been keeping company with an unknown man, and a description by one of the neighbors tallied with a description of a maniac who killed another girl a week before. The description followed, and Jeannie read it aloud to herself. 
Five feet ten. Nice looking. Dressed in perfect taste. He flatters the girls he meets with his continental manners. And his voice is low and soft. He, he's never seen without a derby hat. His gloves are always new. And by profession, he claims to be an actor. You know, there are people in the world who never grow old, even though they live to be a hundred years old. Somehow they shoulder their cares very lightly and their minds remained young and strong. Jeannie Clare's mind was young and it was strong, but she grew up far beyond her years when she read that paper. She just sat there and shook her pretty head in a funny sort of a way. You could see she didn't want to believe what she read. She was trying to convince herself it was only a coincidence. Well, Jeannie, perhaps it is. There are many men who could answer that description, and lots of them could be actors. Only this particular man is the man you love. Remember that. But suddenly Jeannie noticed another fact. The man they were after had come from Chicago. They traced him to New York from there. Well, that was different. Hadn't Keith told her his folks lived in St. Louis? Of course he had. At least twice. Jeannie laughed in relief. <laughs> then fell asleep on the couch from sheer nervous exhaustion. The next evening, as she and Keith walked up the street after dinner, Jeannie was ashamed of herself for ever having the thought she'd had. He was so tall and straight in his well-kept clothes, and she felt proud just to be walking by his side. Somehow he was even nicer than he'd ever been before. And he started to tell her about the play he was in. The melodrama, Jeannie. A what? You know, a play about crime. Oh. <laughs> Not the usual one, though. Uh, I think it ought to be a hit. I hope so, Keith. <laughs> you know, I guess ordinarily I wouldn't have taken a part like that. Ah, you know the way I am, Jeannie. I worship Shakespeare. I, I'd rather... Well, I'd rather carry a sword in the Hamlet than have a lead in any comedy in town. But, uh... I don't know. This part should give me the foothold I need, and. Uh, at least I'll start to make enough money to plan for the future. You... You mean you took this part just for me, Keith? <laughs> uh, let's say I took it for both of us, and we'll let it go at that, huh? Hey, would you like to see a rehearsal one day? Oh, I sure would. <laughs> you won't let it scare you, I hope. <laughs> scare me? Well, the play is pretty violent. In fact, it's quite a shock. You see, it involves a homicidal maniac, a man who likes to kill for pleasure. <laughs> it's got... You dropped your purse. Hey, Jeannie, you've broken your mirror. Keith? Yes, Jeannie? Someday I, I'd like to meet your folks. Someday you shall, Jeannie. I, I know St. Louis is a long way off, but... St. Louis? Oh, they don't live there anymore. But, but you told me... Oh, they were born there. Oh, yeah. About a couple of years ago, they moved, Jeannie. They did? To where? Chicago. Chicago. It couldn't have been Los Angeles or Salt Lake City. It had to be Chicago. And Jeannie almost felt she was going to be sick. She managed to keep herself composed until they said goodnight, though. Keith was due at rehearsal at eight, so he didn't take her home. And Jeannie was never so glad to get back to her room in her life. She sat down near the radio and tried to catch her breath. Her head was pounding and she could hardly think. She kept saying over and over to herself, Is Keith the man they want? She couldn't turn him in unless she was sure. And how could she be sure? Then she turned the radio on. She didn't know exactly why. She was frightened, lonesome, miserable. She wanted to hear a voice, any voice, someone who'd talk to her so she'd know she wasn't alone. She heard a voice all right, and the words burned holes in her heart. And the United Nations will discuss the matter during their next session. New York. The police have unearthed new evidence concerning the homicidal maniac who has gone as claimed three victims thus far. He apparently was able to hoodwink his unhappy victims into believing he'd fallen in love with them and was about to propose marriage. <gasps> The police are hoping to apprehend the killer before he has a chance to add another victim to his list. Operator, get me the police department. She gave them her name and told them where he worked. He'd be at the theater now, she said, in rehearsal. They promised to send a squad car and a detective over to her place in 15 minutes for her protection. 15 minutes. That wasn't long by the usual standards. But as Jeannie hung up... She began to experience the most harrowing 15 minutes of her life. Huh? Jeannie! Jeannie, you're there! Keith? Jeannie? What are you doing here? When you left me an hour ago, I was worried. You behaved so strangely. I, I thought of calling you. Then decided to come instead. And just talk to you. 
What about rehearsal, Keith? Oh, that. <laughs> well, I rehearsed for ten minutes and I left the theater. Well, don't worry. I, I promised I'd be back in an hour or two. Anyway, I'm I'm not in the second act. Of it. Jeannie. Yes. What's the matter? Why do you keep moving away from me like that? I haven't been moving Jeannie. away. What's happened? Why do you stare at me? It, almost as though you're afraid. I, I wish you'd leave me alone for a while. Just a little while, Keith. I, Jeannie, I, you've got to tell I, me what's wrong. Has it been because... Because I haven't asked you to marry me yet? No! No, it's not that! Jeannie, come here. Jeannie had moved to the other end of the room and her back was against the wall. Fifteen minutes, they told her. It would take a detective fifteen minutes to arrive, but fifteen minutes might be too late. Keith kept coming closer, smiling, talking, his hands and arms stretched out. Then she saw a bulge in his right-hand coat pocket, and she knew it was a gun. Jeannie, darling, what's the matter? You mustn't be afraid of me. His hands were on her shoulders now, and he was pulling her close. For a moment, she could hardly breathe. And then she let him kiss her. She had to, because she wanted to get hold of that gun. Oh, Jeannie. Inch by inch, her hand crept toward his pocket, and then inside. She felt the trigger, and then the handle, and with all the strength she had left, she pulled it out and fired. Take it easy. A masher? I tell you, he's a maniac. Maybe he's not, lady, but he ain't the guy we're looking for. That... A guy? We caught that girl killer half an hour ago. Jeannie just stood there and looked at him. The words just didn't sink in. And then she started to laugh. She laughed and she couldn't control herself. She laughed until she cried. For it was then that Jeannie realized that she had killed the wrong man. Hey, miss. Hey, miss, hang on to yourself. Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry, Sergeant. I... I... That officer must have thought that I was the one who, who was crazy when he brought me here. Uh, well, now we'll see when he gets back. Just relax. Take it easy. Yeah. What? Did you say something, Sergeant? No, I didn't. Uh, look behind you. Jeannie. Here's your corpse, Sarge. Only ain't so stiff. Walked down here by herself. And there's the rod. Filled with blacks. Can you beat it? That? Huh? It's just a prop we use in the play. I guess I forgot to leave it at the theater tonight when I left the rehearsal. When you fired it, Jeannie, I... Must have got such a shock I passed out. Story of Jeannie Clare is recorded by The Clock. Well, I see we've used up our allotted span, for the clock keeps running, and the hands keep moving around. So, good people, accept each minute with gratitude and with joy. Time is good to most of you, and most of you make good use of time. But remember, it's later than you think, so use your time well this week, and return again to listen to The Clock. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. 
This program is written by Lawrence Clee, and you heard Hart McGuire as the clock, and as Jeannie, Wendy Playfair, as Keith, John Mellion. Others in the cast were Joan Lander, Derek Barnes, and Joe McCormick. The clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. The confession you're about to hear is an actual recording. Go ahead, please. I make this confession of my own free will because it is true. There has not been any force or violence used upon my person to induce me to make these statements. Without promise of immunity or reward or gratuity, I confess. You understand, of course, that your statement will be made public through the radio program Confession? I do. And that your name for the purpose of this broadcast will be Doris Kane? Yes. For what comfort you may find in so doing, you will now be allowed to tell your story. If there is comfort for your listeners, it must lie in the fact that you've been apprehended. Do you understand all this? Yes, sir, I understand. In the hope that someone somewhere may benefit from my mistakes, I confess. <laughs> You are listening to Confession. The case history of the woman referred to as Doris Kane is a matter of documented record. You will hear the story of her crime experience as told in her own words. Doris Kane, please state your age. I'm 15 years old. And you're pregnant? Yes, I expect my baby in three months. I'll go ahead with your story. <clears throat> well, I knew Jimmy was dead. Even before they told me, I knew he was dead. And I... I... Suppose you try to tell it from the beginning. You lived in Cleveland. I ran away. But your home was there. Yes, my mother still lives there. I lived with her. And your father? My father and her separated. What does your mother do for a living? She sews. She does sewing. Why did you leave home? I don't know. Maybe... I guess because she was always treating me like a kid. Doris? That you, Doris? Mm-hmm. You know what time it is. Yeah. Twelve o'clock. I know. Bumming around till midnight. Where were you? Out. Out. Where? With some friends. Friends like Jimmy, I suppose. Oh, you just don't like you him. You spend that money I gave you? I still got it. Who bought for you this evening? Nobody. Listen here, when I ask you a question, I want answers. Who bought for you? Nobody. I'm going to bed. You come back here. What do you want? You was out with Jimmy, wasn't you? Oh, right. I was out with Jimmy. Don't you give me them talking back answers. <gasps> Mom. Where did you go? <gasps> we went bowling. Bowling. Jimmy bought you liquor, didn't he? I didn't have any liquor. Don't lie to me. I could smell it when you come in. He bought you liquor, a kid like you. I'm not a kid. Oh. I can't do anything with you. I give up. I've done all I can. You're just no good. <laughs> It 
It was like she said I was no good. Jimmy was at the bowling alley. He wanted me to meet him there after they closed up at two o'clock. To say goodbye, he said, because he was going away and I might never see him again. Then I got a crazy idea. Maybe I could go with him. I put my clothes in a box and sneaked out the back way. Jimmy was glad to see me. That was one thing about Jimmy. Always glad to see me. Dory, I thought you weren't coming. I wasn't. Your mom, huh? You know how she is. I'd have gone crazy if you hadn't come back to say goodbye. You never did tell me where you were going. Well, we don't really know ourselves, just west. I thought you were going alone. Uh Uh-uh, with Frankie. You know, my partner. What's in the box? Clothes. What for? I'm running away. From home? Gee, things must be rough. Yeah. Jimmy, take me along. Take you along with us? Please, Jimmy, I won't be any trouble, honest, I won't. Gee, I don't know. Please, Jimmy. Please. But we might not come back. I don't care. Maybe we'll never come back. Please. Well, maybe. Okay, why not? Thanks, Jimmy. Sure, come on. We went across town to the Congress Hotel, I think it was. Jimmy said he had to meet Frankie there. He waited out on the sidewalk. And then about a half an hour, a car pulled up in front of the hotel. Jimmy opened the door for me. All right, hop in, Dory. All right. I'll put your stuff in the back. Doris, this is Frank, my partner. Hello. You didn't say anything about bringing a girl along. We just arranged it. I said the two of us. If you don't like it, let us out at the next corner. Oh, take it easy. Don't get blisters. It's just that you didn't say anything. Forget it, will you? Sure. Sure, if you say she's okay, only she looks kind of young. How old are you? Fourteen. Your mother know what you're doing? No. What'll she do when she finds out? Nobody can make me go back if I don't want to. Let's not talk about it. We'll decide later. Come here, honey. Comfortable? Frank drove fast. Jimmy put his arm around me. I felt warm inside. After a while, I fell asleep. When I woke up, it was daylight. Jimmy was sleeping. We were somewhere out in the country. Frankie didn't seem sleepy at all. He just kept driving. When Jimmy woke up about an hour later, we stopped at a little gas station. It was just this gas station. No other buildings around. How's it look to you, Jimmy? Fine. It's pretty out of the way. There's no other customers. No waiting. Just what I was thinking. I'll be right back. It's sure dead out here. Yeah. Frank must be tired. Frank never gets tired, as long as he can get a fix. He's gone inside the station. Yeah. You know something. What? You're pretty. What did you mean before about Frankie? Mm-hmm. About not getting tired long as he can get a fix. H. You know, heroin. He's hooked on the stuff. Oh. No kidding, Dora. You're real pretty. Say. Yeah? <laughs> Where's Frank? What's keeping Frank? I don't know. Oh, Dory. I love you, Dory. Jimmy. You love me? Yes. Yes, I do, Jimmy. Hey, I got a great idea. What? Why don't we get married? Married? Why not? Listen, honey. Frank's got something big lined up, real big. He's taking me in with him. We'll have plenty of money. We'll get an apartment in San Francisco, maybe. How does that sound, honey? Jimmy, it sounds wonderful. Oh, honey. Here comes Frank. Oh, yeah. All right, let's get rolling. You didn't get any gas. No. How was it, Frank? Not bad, not good. Fifty. That's all he had. Fifty? That's okay. Jimmy, what is it? Jimmy, what happened? Something happened. Take it easy, Dory. Everything's all right. See anybody in the back? Just a second. Nope, all clear. Okay. Now, let's try to hold us for a while. Jimmy! Hey, Frank, guess what? Huh? Dory and me, we're going to get married. Married? 
You're both kind of young for that. We'll tell them we're older. We'll make ourselves look older. You can give the bride away. I'm kidding. Married, huh? Here comes a bride, big, fat, and wide. <laughs> da 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 We got the license. Then we stopped at a country judge's place and got married. Frank was the witness. By that time, it was getting towards evening. Frank was going to try to connect for some H. He said he was running out of caps. He drove Jimmy and me to a motel. It wasn't much of a honeymoon, I guess, but I was Jimmy's wife, and I didn't care where we stayed as long as we were together. You know. Wonder where they're going. Out west, too, maybe. Happy, honey? Mm, Jimmy, it's wonderful. Old married people, huh? Yeah. Jimmy, what happened? What happened when? At the gas station. The money Frank gave us, he got at the gas station, didn't he? So what? But a hold-up. He did it. We didn't do it. He did it. I'm scared. Dory, you mad at me? No, I'm not mad. But Frank, he's a real dope addict, isn't he? Yeah, he's hooked bad. If he don't score, he goes crazy. Are you, Jimmy? What? Hooked. Me hooked? Of course not. Do you use it? Maybe a joy pop once in a while, just for kicks. But I haven't got a habit, if that's what you mean. Just now and then. Who's that? Frank, probably. I'll get it. No, you wait here. Yes? State police. You Mr. Kane? Yeah, that's me. A partner and I'd like to see you outside. What for? There's a gas station held up about 75 miles east of here. We're checking all late arrivals. Hold up? I didn't have anything to do with a hold up. Officer? Hmm? Officer, he didn't have anything to do with any hold up. Stay out of this, Doris. We just got married, see? Here's our marriage license. He's in with me all day. Let me see that. <laughs> Just got married today, huh? Wow. Congratulations. Here you are. Thanks. Oh, say. Yeah? How old are you? Uh, 21. Yeah. Yeah, the man they described was much older. Well, good luck, kids. Thanks. part of it now. I'd lied for him. The next morning, Frank picked us up. His eyes looked funny, like he was doped or something. He said he'd found a mule. You know, someone who sells heroin? We told him about the state police, and he got mad. We went about 50 miles, and then Frank pulled up at another gas station. I was scared. Jimmy kept telling me to take it easy. Frank got out of the car and left Jimmy and me sitting there. We didn't say anything. We just sat there. We just sat there waiting. Quiet. Frank? All clear? Uh, yeah, all clear. Frank? Yeah? Did you have to kill him? I don't like witnesses. But you didn't have to kill him, did you? I don't like cops on my neck. Why did you have to kill him? Because I had to, that's why. Now shut up. You are listening to Confession. Before continuing with the documented record of the woman referred to as Doris Kane, the National Broadcasting Company is honored to present Mr. Richard A. McGee, Director of Corrections, Department of Corrections, State of California. We in correctional work know the dangers that exist in exposing young people to evil influence. In tonight's case, three stages of crime are apparent. The narcotic addict, who is already a hardened criminal, the younger user, who is well on the road to becoming both addict and criminal, and the adolescent girl just exposed to evil influence. Without proper guidance and parental control, she too is destined for disaster. If you expect to help your own children keep out of trouble, know where they go and whom they are with. 
Most of all, let them know they are loved and respected by you. A child who feels rejected in the home will turn to wrong companions for acceptance. Thank you, Mr. McGee. Now to continue with confession and the documented record of the woman referred to as Doris Kane. We kept driving west. We'd stop in different places on the way, sometimes a week, sometimes only a couple of days. We changed cars lots of times. Frank got them off parking lots. He always changed the license plates, putting on cold plates, he said. We kept on the move. It was almost three months now. And I guess the only reason I didn't run out was because I was married to Jimmy. Someplace near Denver, I got sick on the road and we had to stop. After I was all right, we went on again. I was afraid of Frank. He kept using more and more narcotics. Doris? Yeah? You okay now? I'm okay. From now on, you earn your way. What? I said from now on, she earns her way. No more dead weight. Now listen. You heard me. And I want you coming in on the jobs with me. Jimmy. Be easy with both of us where it counts. And use her for a lookout. Why does she have to get into this? Because she's here and we're feeding her, that's why. Listen. Now you listen, Buster. After we hit the big job in Frisco, you're on your own. I don't care what you do. You take your cut and scram, but until then, I'm the boy. I'm not going to do it. It's just till we get to Frisco, honey. I'm not going to do it. I'll be depending on you, honey. You don't want me killed, do you? Why can't you quit, Jimmy? What if they catch us? That'll be up to you. Right, Frank? That's right, Doris. It's up to you. After that, I was the lookout. I don't remember how many holdups there were. It was all like a dream. When we got to San Francisco, we got a room in Richmond. That's across the bay. And Frank got a place in town. Frank had plans for this big job. That's what he called it, the big job. He didn't tell me any of the details. He didn't want me along on this one. For the first time, Jimmy was carrying a gun. I tried to talk to him before he left. It's funny, you remember silly things. I remember the landlady was vacuuming in the hallway outside. Listen, honey. Don't do it, Jimmy, please. This is the last one, honey, the last one. After this, we don't have to worry anymore. I can't help worrying. Oh, Jimmy, it's everything. Everything. What do you mean, everything? Are you hooked now, Jimmy? Did Frankie hook you on the stuff so you can't do without it? I use a little. Sure, I use. You know that. So what? Let's not talk about it, you hear? Please, Jimmy. Please don't go today. It's all set, honey. Now listen to me. What if something goes wrong? Nothing's going wrong. Now listen to me, will you? It's three o'clock. Frank will get back here at five with the money. Are you listening? I'm listening. Okay. Frank and I are going to have to separate. I'll take the bus back here. It'll take longer, but it'll be safer. You'll be all packed and ready to go. I don't like it, Jimmy. The last job, honey. After that, we go south to where it's warm and find a place to settle down. After that, no more. Be careful. Please be careful. Now, don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Goodbye, honey. Jimmy. I didn't have a radio or a newspaper or anything. I just sat there and waited. Then I began to feel sick. Sicker than I ever felt before. I thought it was because I was nervous or something. I went out and saw the landlady, and she told me to lay down, and she went for a doctor. The doctor came and gave me something and went away. After six o'clock, Jimmy came in. He was all out of breath. I was so glad to see him, I cried. Hi, honey. <gasps> oh, Jimmy! No, honey, take it easy, honey. There's nothing to cry about. Everything was perfect, not a hitch. Oh, I thought I'd never see you again. Don't be silly. They can't hurt me. Where's Frank? Oh, he's not here. Not here? Well, I took the bus. He had the car. He should have been here long ago. Hey, maybe they picked him up. You think they did? Otherwise, he'd be here. Oh, boy, I hope not. I told him I should have taken part of the money. We haven't got any dough. Jimmy. Yeah? Remember? I felt sick that time. Well, I got sick again. I had to have a doctor. When? While you were gone just now. What was the trouble? The doctor was here. He says I'm going to have a baby. What? That's what he said. Honey. 
Jimmy, what are we going to do? A baby. What are we going to do? That's wonderful. When Frank gets here, we'll have a big celebration. That's what we're going to do. We'll celebrate all the way down to L.A. I wonder where he is. Frank's too smart for the cops. They never got him. Did they see you? I don't know. All I know is we can't stay here. What about Frank? He's got the money. He's got the car. I'll tell you what. We'll wait here till morning. Then I'll go down and get a paper. The paper will tell us whether they got him. Jimmy, I'm scared. Ah, don't worry, honey. Frank will be here. He's too smart for those dumb cops. He'll be here. Only, I'm getting the shakes. I sure could use a fix. <laughs> We didn't go to sleep. Jimmy took a fix and kept pacing the floor all night. I knew now that Jimmy was an addict, too. I got sick again. Finally, when the morning papers came out, Jimmy went down and got one. When he came back, his face was white. How do you like that? How do you like that? What's the matter? Here it is, right here in the paper. But there's nothing about anybody getting caught. It says they got away. How do you like that? We've been left high and dry. He's got all the money. Every penny of it. He ditched us. He took the car and all the money and he ditched us. Jimmy, we got to get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, we got to. No car, no money. You going to have a baby? We'll be all right, Jimmy. Sure. Sure, we'll be all right. We'll clean up, honey. You and me. Who needs Frank anyhow? Only, without him, where can I connect for some stuff? And, Dory, I got to have it now. I got to have it. I packed our bag and we left We were pretty lucky We hitched a ride out of town And then we got another ride It was a small truck The man was going all the way to Los Angeles We rode a couple of hours And then I got to feeling sick again What's the matter, honey? I don't feel well What you need is some coffee If I didn't have my three cups in the morning I wouldn't be fit to go out the door That's what it means to me My wife Mister. says... Yeah? This is a gun in my pocket. What? Don't get excited. Just turn down that side road. Hey, what is this? Don't talk. Just do as I say. This might go off. Okay, take it easy. That's fine. Now stop. Hand your wallet over here. Oh, wait a minute. Now, I, I got all my identification in there. Take the money, but for Pete's the sake... The wallet, I said... Now, get out. This is plain stupid of you, buddy. Get out. And walk around in front of the truck. Where are you going, Jimmy? Wait here. And hold this. Okay, mister. Turn around. What are you going to do? Just this. <laughs> okay, honey. Jimmy! Jimmy, you killed him. He'll be okay. I just clunked him on the head. Gives us more time. You shouldn't have done that, Jimmy. Look in the wallet. How much is there in you it? You shouldn't have done come it. Come on, come on. How much is there? Well, let's see. Twenty dollars. Just one twenty dollar bill. Twenty dollars? That's not bad. When we get the Merced, I'll make a connection and get a couple of caps. We'll ditch the truck, then we'll swipe a car someplace and pull a job that'll keep us a while. Please, Jimmy, no more. Are you crazy? We gotta have money. I gotta have it right away. I'll get a job, Jimmy. The cop's right behind us, and you're gonna get a job. Don't talk silly, honey. Our luck's hot. Besides, I know how to pull him now. Maybe you killed him. No, Jimmy, we... No, no, no. I didn't hit him that hard. Just hard enough to make him sleepy. I didn't kill him. Maybe you did. Jimmy, what are we gonna do? I told you. I can't take it anymore. Running away. Always running away, and now you hooked. You hooked. What's the matter with you? Nothing. Only I... You scared of something? Yes, I'm scared. But not for myself. I'm scared for you. If you don't like the setup, why don't you just pull out? Go ahead. Grab the first bus back home to Mama, why don't you? Don't talk like that, Jimmy. I don't mean... Hey. What? Frank. <laughs> he doesn't know it, but he did me a real favor. Just when we needed a break. Good old Frank. What is it, Jimmy? I just happened to remember. A couple of weeks ago, Frank was telling me about a place. Drugstore in Fresno. That's real close to here. A pushover, he says. They'll probably have a big narco supply, too. We'll break it tonight, you and me. I can't, Jimmy. They'll get us. I just can't. Quit saying you can't. Now be quiet. I gotta think. I 
tried to talk him out of it, but he only got madder. We ditched the truck in Merced, then Jimmy used up his last cap. About nine o'clock that night, we got a ride into Fresno. We got something to eat. Then we went into a parking lot, took a black sedan, and got out of there fast. Then we drove out to the place. It was closed. Jimmy was like a crazy man. He knew there was narcotics inside the store. I kept the motor running, and Jimmy went up to the front door. My heart was pounding harder than it ever did before. Jimmy kicked in the plate glass in the door and went inside. And a bell started clanging. It was a burglar alarm. Then I saw the patrol car swing into the alley alongside the store, and I started flashing the lights and honking the horn. I could see Jimmy through the window. He ducked behind a showcase. One of the police was running toward the back of the building. The other ran in the front door. I ran in after him. Remember, I was screaming, Jimmy, Jimmy, trying to be heard over the burglar alarm. And then the shots. Jimmy, Jimmy! Come on with your hands up. Come and get me. Jimmy! Doris, get out of here. You want to get yourself killed? Jimmy! Out with your hands up. Duck down, Doris. You're in my way. Doris, get out of here. Don't shoot, Jimmy. Get out of the way. How do you like that, copper? Jimmy! Jimmy. Okay, Harry, I think we got him. <laughs> hey, lady, you hurt? Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Come on, get up. Get up now. You killed him. Almost got you, too. What was the idea of running right in the line of fire? Jimmy. <laughs> what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You're coming with us. <laughs> Our baby. Our baby. What baby? He was my husband. I'm going to have a baby. Baby? Let's have a look at you. Why, you're just... You kid. There wasn't a dollar in that cash register. Somebody tried to break in last night. We picked him up. Last night? Frank? Yeah, that's his name. Frank, uh... Frank Leonard. You know him? <laughs> Frank! <laughs> sure, I know him. Oh, he's the one you should have killed. <laughs> You have just heard an actual confession. This case history of the woman referred to as Doris Kane is a matter of documented record. To protect the legal rights of this girl, names and places were changed or deleted. Technical advice for confession comes from the office of the Director of Corrections, Department of Corrections, State of California. In a moment, you will again hear Doris Kane. Doris Kane was arrested in Merced County, State of California, and tried under Section 700, Sub M W I C. James R. Kane's body was claimed by his parents and returned to Cleveland for burial. Frank O. Leonard was extradited to Ohio to stand trial for murder, and the state of California has holds on him for grand theft auto, robbery, and burglary. Now Doris Kane. I made this broadcast in the hope that someone somewhere may benefit from our mistakes. My husband Jimmy was only 18 when he died. Frank's 23, and you might say his life's over, too. A lot of boys and girls are following in our footsteps and don't know it. I'm a ward of the Juvenile Court of Merced County at the El Retiro State School for Girls. I'll be a ward of the court until I'm 21. Because of my age, my baby will not have to be born in a prison, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful, too, that I escaped becoming a drug addict. I guess I'm most thankful of all for that because I've seen what it does to you. Can I? Of course. Night, Mom. This has been Confession. Transcribed statements of actual crimes. These true tragedies are brought to you each week as an NBC Radio Network production in an effort to stem the nation's forward march of crime. Credit for this broadcast goes to our cast. Paul Fries, Joyce McCluskey, Virginia Gregg, Sam Edwards, Stacey Harris, Marvin Miller. Script supervision, Warren Lewis. Music, Michael Samogi. 
Direction, Homer Canfield. John Wall speaking. Confession, a Canfield Lewis creation came to you from California. There is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black-eyed kids submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black-eyed kids phenomenon, coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul-eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend? another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night. Listen to the book and find out. The Black Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. The manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King Cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Good evening, friends of the Creaking Door. The creaking door is open. So do come in. Do you subscribe to the view that some of us have power over the life and death of someone else? John does. He knows when people are going to die. And that can be most upsetting for all concerned. <laughs> Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you... It's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. 
and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3 5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3 5s today. John is not a usual sort of man, although he has a very ordinary sort of name. John Smith. What could be more ordinary than that? But he is the most unusual man, really. Take his blood group, for instance. His blood group is group A, B. Very rare indeed, as the doctor is pointing out to him. Only 2% of people belong to group A, B, Mr. Smith. I know my group is very rare. And this young girl is dying. She must have a transfusion as soon as possible, otherwise she will die. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But surely I'm not the only person with this type of blood in the area? No doubt there are other people, but we don't know everyone's blood group offhand, just like that. We depend, as you know, on blood donors. You're the only registered donor in this area. But, but there must be someone else. Oh, believe me, Mr. Smith, there isn't. Anyway, giving a transfusion isn't anything to worry about. There's nothing to it. I've given blood before. I know that. Then you'll help us? You'll help the young girl? I, I can't. I, I can't go through that again. I won't. You've no right to ask oh, me. Please, Mr. Smith, calm down. What I'm asking isn't so terrible. Yes, it is. But you said you're... You don't know what you're asking. I can't do it. Mr. Smith, unless young Beryl Rogers receives a transfusion of blood, type AB blood... She will most certainly die. There must be somebody else who can do it. Why pick on me? I've told you why, Mr. Smith. You're the only registered donor in the area. Well, then what about outside the area? What about blood banks? You keep supplies of blood under refrigeration these days, don't you? Our own local supplies of AB blood from the blood bank are exhausted. To find supplies elsewhere and fly them here would take too long. The girl would die. Oh, hang it all, man. All I'm asking you to do is give a pint of your blood. That's all. Not your life. No. That's not what you're asking. And you don't know what you're asking. I can't do it. I can't. Very well. And then there's nothing more I can do. Well, I can't force you, I'm afraid. There is, unfortunately, no law which says that one must give blood. But I hope, Mr. Smith, that you'll be able to live with your conscience after tonight. After this young girl dies because you won't help. Then I hope you can face yourself in the mirror each day. It wouldn't be saving her. Don't you understand? It wouldn't. It would be only postponing something which might as well be ended now. This girl's life has already ended. Unless you can find someone else to help. You're the only one, Mr. Smith. I've told you before. You're the only one. Her only chance. Then if I'm her only chance, she hasn't got one. You refuse to help her? Yes. Mr. Smith, this is a free country. You have every right to say that. You must have a very good reason for letting a young girl go to an untimely death like this. I have. Won't you tell me what it is? You wouldn't believe me. Nobody believes me. I promise. I, I listen with an open mind. You see, the girl's father is waiting outside to hear your decision. I'll have to tell him something. All right. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what's been making my life a nightmare for the last three years. I first registered as a blood donor about three and a half years ago. As you said, my group is the rarest. There aren't many donors. But also... There aren't so many people needing transfusions. So it was about five months before I was called on to help. He was a young man, Derek Evans. I still remember his name. He'd been badly cut up in a motor accident. They phoned me from this hospital at about two in the morning. I came along here and 
gave two pints of blood. It, it saved young Derek's life. At least that's what we all thought. But it didn't save his life, really. It only saved him a far more horrible death. Two or three days after I'd given the blood, I, I came along to the hospital to see how he was getting on. By this time, he was sitting up in bed looking quite well again. I was interested to see the man whose life had been saved by my blood, I suppose. But also, I, I felt I had to see him. You see, Doctor, my blood was flowing in his veins. Already I felt a strange sort of kinship with him. I sat on the chair beside his bed. I smiled at him. Uh, how are you feeling? Oh, fine, fine. It's uh, funny to think about it, isn't it? What? Uh, well, that, that your blood is now flowing around my body, uh, through my brain, and making me think and breathe. Yes. Yes, it, it is. Although I, I must confess, I, I don't feel any different. 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 Different, 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 different,
What name was that again? Uh, Evans. Derek Evans. Uh, he was in a motor accident. Oh, uh, that, Mr. Evans. I'm afraid it will be no use coming to see him, sir. Why not? He was discharged from hospital two days ago. <laughs> his home, of course. But his mother told me that he'd gone away for a week or so into the country to convalesce. She must have been a little suspicious of me making odd phone calls by this time because she refused to tell me if I could get in touch with him. But looking back, it wouldn't have been any good anywhere. At the time, I told myself that I was behaving hysterically over nothing and tried to put the whole thing from my mind. I succeeded, too, up to a point... Until a couple of days later, I bought the evening paper as usual. And there it was, staring me in the face. A young man, Derek Evans, was drowned there in the quicksand, not far from the village of Maidside. His fiancée, Jill Worthing, was with him. So now you see, Doctor, why I'm not going to give this young girl any of my blood. My blood is evil. It brings about death in the most horrible fashion. And worse than that, I know about it in advance. taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. seem to understand what you're asking. I've told you it's happened four times in the past, and each time I've lived under a terrible shadow of doom and until the person concerned has died. But look, if you believe what you say to be true, then one can take precautions. Take Derek Evans, for instance. He could have been prevented from going away into the country. The tragedy could have been avoided. I said that with Rose Warwick. But at least in her case, I was sure that my vision couldn't possibly come through. What happened? Rose was a cripple. I gave her blood, saved her life. Then I saw her quite clearly in my mind's eye. She was screaming for help and there was ice all around her and ice skating. The more I thought about it, the more impossible it was. She couldn't even walk, let alone skate. At last I thought this sequence was going to be broken. I should be free. And what happened? She was in a crowded cinema when it caught fire. She died, burnt to death. And the film that was showing was called Winter Wonderland. All about ice skating. Well, well, what? 
that. Are you going to save my daughter's life, or are you going to let her die? I can't do it, Mr. Rogers. Maybe your daughter, Bella, will live without my assistance. That's quite impossible. And we only have about 15 minutes left at the outside. I can't do it. You're, you're a monster. That's what you are. A monster. Now, listen to me, Mr. Smith. I promise you one thing. If you don't help my little girl and she dies, I'll kill you. All right. All right, what's the use? You don't want to understand either of you. I'll do it. Good. But I'm warning you. I won't be saving your daughter's life, Mr. Rogers. I'll just be keeping her alive so that she can die in a much more horrible fashion. How's the respiration? Normal, Doctor. Send the donor? I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Uh, she's already getting some color in her cheeks. Uh, all right, nurse, remove the needle. Very well, Doctor. Mr. Smith, I can't thank you enough. 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 standing with his back to me. I, I I couldn't see his face, but where is it? It, it, it was terrible. Look, what? What did you see? This man had his hands round her throat. And he was strangling her. I haven't saved this poor girl, Doctor. She's going to be murdered. That's right. It's funny to think about it, isn't it? Your blood being pumped about inside me. It must be nice blood because I'm feeling much better. I'm glad. How old are you, Bill? Sixteen. Nearly seventeen. When are you leaving the hospital? About a week, the doctor said. You... You will be careful, won't you? You're such a pretty girl. Careful? What, what do you mean? Nothing. Nothing. Just be careful, huh? This doesn't come true this time. Hello. Hello, Beryl. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, of course. while I was in hospital. Oh, nonsense, it's just... You told me that if ever I was in trouble, if ever I needed any help... Well, of course, there's, there's nothing wrong, is there? Well, you met my father, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. How is he? he he's dead. He died last month. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to do. That's why I came to you. You see, I'm not quite 17 yet. Unless I have a respectable place to stay... Well, they're going to put me in a home. That would be awful. That's why I came to you. You said if ever I... I got a job, I could pay for my keep. It wouldn't cost you anything. I haven't got any relatives or friends. My mother's been dead for years. I tried to work out what I should do. And you're the only person I could think of. Please, won't you help me? No, 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 no. Now, don't cry. Of course I'll help you. 
I've been thinking about you quite a lot these last three or four months. I keep an eye on you. Maybe this time I, I could make sure that that vision didn't come true. She moved in. I had a big house and there was plenty of room. I've never married, never had a family. And it was wonderful at first. Just having someone to care about and someone who cared about me. Oh, there was nothing else in it but that. I know what people have been saying, but that was nonsense. She was like a daughter to me, the daughter I'd never had. And she brought my help. From the start, I, I didn't trust him. He, he was too cocky, too competent. And he was evil. Uncle John, this is Mike. Oh, pleased to meet you, I'm sure. How's it going? We're going out for a drive. There is a course, well, don't be too late back, will you? Oh, don't worry, Mr. Smith. I'll bring you back safe and sound. inside said that if I allowed her to leave, this Mike was going to strangle her. It had always been true before. I had to make sure it didn't come true this time. I had to. I raced up the stairs after and threw open the door of her room. She had an open suitcase on the bed and was throwing clothes into it. You're not leaving. Yes, I am. And you can't stop me. I can't, can't I? I'll see you do as I tell you, you little tramp. I'll see that you don't get murdered. I'll save you in spite of yourself. And now I knew why 
private figure whose back I'd seen been vaguely familiar. It had been me who I'd seen commit murder. All right, Sergeant. Take him away. I only hope the judge believes your story, Smith. Because I don't. a few blood brothers, in fact. after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3-5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3 fives today. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door, of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present... Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee.
delicate case of murder. At 2 a.m., I say, Winstead, will your wife be down shortly? Yes. Laura promised a special seance from Miss Keaton here at 2. Yes, and I can hardly wait. I've always been so curious about things like this, but I've never attended a seance before. Well, I assure you, Miss Keaton, you'll find it most fascinating. I've been watching Laura practice for almost five years. She makes more progress with every sitting. It's absolutely astounding what she can do. Uh, isn't it, Winstead? Yes. Quite. Oh, yes. She really didn't know she had the power, you know, until about 1937. Remember Winstead, the, the penthouse party? Who gave the beastly thing? Do you remember? Yes, I remember very well. It was Quentin Ramsey. Oh, yes, that's who it was. Ramsey had a mystic oracle board, you know, Ouija. No one could get the thing to work until they coaxed Laura to sit down and have a try. And she made the board work? Oh, indeed she did. All over the place. <laughs> it was absolutely weird. She got messages from several of the guest friends who had passed on some time ago. People she'd never heard of until that night. How wonderful. Well, she used the board for about a year and then found out she could get pencil messages. Pencil messages? Yes, yeah, she simply substituted a pencil for the little heart-shaped board with the eyes and glass window. Her messages came in more rapidly that way, were more complete, and this method was less tiring for her. You mean she actually contacts departed spirits that way? I mean she did. But she gave up the writing method two years ago. Uh, didn't she, Winstead? Yes, thank heavens. Every place I'd go, I'd find a paper simply covered with strange scratchings and harebrained so-called messages. But look here, old fellow. Do I detect a shade of sarcasm in your voice? I dare say you do. I'm rather bored with the whole thing. But why, Winstead? Simply because it's all a lot of... Well, go on. Oh, never mind. No, oh, I wish you'd come on downstairs and get this thing over with. But, Rika, I urge you not to waste your time with this foolishness. Foolishness? <laughs> now, look here, Winstead. You can't talk about your wife's work like that. No, darling, really. I'm absolutely fascinated by it all. I can't wait for Mrs. Winstead to come down. No, she'll be down in a moment. I say, Winstead, really, I can't understand your attitude about Laura's work. Why, you used to enjoy watching her work immensely. Yes. I used to love her immensely. What? I say, does that mean that you... Uh, do... Mr. Rogers, you said a moment ago that Mrs. Winstead doesn't communicate by means of pencil writing any longer. Uh, why, why, no, she doesn't. After about a year of it, she undertook a profound and comprehensive study of spiritualism and communication with those who have left this level. In her study, she learned that those departed ones can sometimes make contact with us through the use of a medium's voice. Uh, she, uh, well, she began very slowly at first lying relaxed on a couch, eyes closed, and eventually her contact began to use a Laura's own voice for their messages. And that's what she'll do for us tonight? That and more. More? Oh, yes. You see, Miss Keaton, after Laura Winstead perfected her means of vocal communication with spirits, she continued her studies and experiments until she became able to bring about uh, materialization. You mean... I mean, uh, now we see the departed one with whom we commune. Oh, well, I really didn't expect that. I thought possibly a few table wrappings. Oh, there'll be more than mere wrappings here tonight, Miss Keaton. Oh, here's Laura now. Uh, Laura, dear. Good evening. Or should I say good morning? It's after 2 a.m. Yes, Laura. We've been waiting for you. Really, I think you could be more prompt. Do you, Harvey? Well, perhaps you should hold the seances instead of me. Now, Laura... There's really no reason for you to make a scene. Oh, no, no, of course not. We're not here for a scene. It's for a seance. Uh, yes, uh, shall we begin, Laura? Yes. Harvey, if this is going to bore you, I suggest you go into the library until we've finished. No, I'll remain here. Then I must ask you to assume the right attitude. You know we always have difficulty getting good contact whenever a disbeliever is present. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Winstead believes, don't you, Harvey? I'd rather ask that same question of you, Frederica. We're finished here. Oh, don't worry about me, Mrs. Winstead. I'm quite open-minded. I'm sure you are, dear. Now, if uh, we'll all gather around the table. 
Rogers, will you turn off the lights, please? Oh, yes. Uh, certainly. There we are. Now we'll all... Oh, oh what's that? Oh, what's wrong? What's happened? Oh, oh, never mind, Laura. Federico, are you all right? Oh, yes. Yes, of course she is. I really missed my chair and bumped into hers. <laughs> so sorry, Miss Keaton. Oh, I'm sorry, too. Please forgive me, but I, I was startled for a moment. There, now. We're all settled. <laughs> it was entirely my fault, Miss Keaton. I, I'm terribly sorry. It's quite all right, Mr. Rogers. Is everyone quite ready? Yes, Laura. All ready. Shall we begin any time now? Harvey, we will begin when the opportune time arrives. Let me tell you once again that if you are impatient, it will be best that you will leave us. Oh, no. No, Harvey, please don't go. Don't worry. I have no intention of leaving. You please all join hands. Roger, give me your hand. Miss Keaton, yours, please. Now, now you two clasp hands with Mr. Winstead. Yes, I, I understand. Harvey, where's your hand? Oh, oh, there it is. All set, Laura. Now, whatever happens, no one is to break the contact. Is that perfectly clear? No one. We will soon make communication with one from another level. Where will we see this? I must ask you to be very quiet, Miss Keaton. No one is to speak. And when the materialization takes place... Please do not utter a sound unless it addresses you personally. We're gathered here to commune with whomsoever wishes to contact us. We've gathered with open minds and with a unity of purpose. If there is someone who wishes to speak to us or any one of us, will he or she please make herself known? Is someone seeking contact? Please knock twice for no, thrice for yes. Do you have a message for someone present? For me? No. For someone else who is present here? Do you wish to speak through me? Do you wish to show yourself to us? Ah, very well. We will await your appearance now. When you are ready to speak through me, please begin. She's gone. Oh, I saw her so plainly. It was my mother. I know it was. Harvey, did you see her? Yes, I saw her. Will you turn up the lights, Roger? Yes, of course. I'm feeling all right, Laura. Yes, quite all right, thank you. Uh, Miss Keaton? Yes, I... I suppose so. I... I don't know what to make of this. It's... It's all so wonderful. 
I take it with a grain of salt, my dear. Try not to think too much about it. Harvey, I'll not have you say such things. Miss Keaton, you've just seen and talked with your mother. You may do so again whenever you wish. In case there's the slightest doubt in your mind, I can assure you that it was your mother. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm sure it was, Mrs. Winstead. And as I say, it's... It's so wonderful. Tell me, why haven't I heard of your ability to do this before now? Because, Miss Keaton, I permit no one to speak of it. I do not wish to become a public figure. I, I give sittings for my friends. I don't wish the world at large to know about my power, so I, I swear every newcomer to complete and absolute secrecy. I'm asking you for your assurance now. You mean you don't want me to speak of this to anyone? Yes, that's what I mean. You must promise to speak to no one of what you have seen here tonight. Very well, Mrs. Winstead. I... As you wish. I shall expect you to keep that promise. No, the seance is ended. I shall bid you all good night. Now, Laura, dear, won't you stay and talk for a while? Thank you, no. I'm very tired, and it's almost three o'clock. I'll see you to the stairs, then, and then I must be going. A Winston, old chap, I'll see you at the office tomorrow. Very well. Thank you, Rogers. Uh, good night, Miss Keaton. Good night, Mr. Rogers. Miss Winston. Good night, my dear. Please come back again when you can. Oh, thank you. I will. Good night, Laura. I'll run Frederica home. I'll be long shortly. Yes, Harvey. Take your time, my dear. <laughs> now, whatever made me say that? I'm sure you will, anyway. Good night. Harvey. She's suspicious. That I'm in love with you? How could she have found out? I told her. You did? Yes. Made a clean breast of it to her. Told her it was no good, she and I trying to continue to make a go of it. It didn't do a bit of good. She refuses to give me a divorce. Oh. I'm really desperate, Frederica. I can't stand living with her another day. She... She's changed so. There's no love in her heart anymore. No warmth. She's suddenly become such a different person. Nagging, sharp-tongued, overbearing. Oh, poor dear. You do need someone to look after you. She must neglect you terribly. She does. I minded a lot at first. Believe me, Frederica, I was always in love with Laura. Now she... She's so indifferent. Everything I try to do for her. But why has she become so indifferent to you? I stopped trying to explain that months ago. I, I don't care anymore. Now that I found you. Harvey. You do love me, don't you, Frederica? Oh, yes, dear. Of course I do. But we can't go on like this. With no solution in view. But there must be a solution. There must be some way. But there is no way. No way except the one Laura denies us. Just give me a little time, Frederica. It isn't hopeless yet. I promise you, Frederica, I'll find a way. Oh, I'll find a way somehow. My darling. Harvey, I'm still thinking about what Laura did here tonight. The apparition, the voice of my mother. Oh, nonsense, Frederica. Darling, what do you mean? Here, I'll show you what I mean. Here, I, I want you to see this, Frederica. Here you are. See? Why, well, that's almost an exact image of my mother. Nothing but a paper mache face, painted to resemble an old lady, an old gray shawl, and some old style spectacles. But how does it work? How did she make it appear? Easily. Look, up above there. An almost invisible wire strung across the room. Laura simply releases an electrically controlled lock on this cabinet behind her chair. Since the invisible wire is placed at a single angle, the so-called spirit slips slowly out in front of those sitting at the table. Here, like, like this. There. Then Laura says whatever she wants to. Changing her voice. When it's all over, she simply manipulates this cord on a pulley inside the cabinet. The image is returned to the cabinet. Simple. Oh, well, then she merely tricked us. Tricked you. 
I've known for years that Laura's nothing but a fraud. You might have kept what you know to yourself, Harvey. Mrs. Winston. Laura, I asked... I asked her not to come here. She insisted that since you extended the invitation, she was obliged to. I felt it only fair to show her that she'd been the victim of a hoax. Oh, Harvey, Never mind, Miss Keaton. I'm not in the least embarrassed. The apparition was a trick, yes. But I assure you, my dear... The voice was not. Oh, of course it was, Laura. You know it. Indeed. Harvey, my dear, there are many things between earth and heaven that none of us know. There are many things that you don't know. Yes, I have used tricks at our meetings. I admit that. But not everything that has happened here has been trickery. You'll have to convince me, Laura. Harvey, I have a feeling... A feeling that someday, somehow, I will convince you. And that when I do, you'll never be able to scoff at me again. Laura. I'm sorry about last night. But we simply must settle this thing once and for all. I can't see that there's anything to settle. You haven't the right to hold me like this, Laura. You don't love me. Why don't you give me my freedom? Simple, Harvey. Because no woman likes to see another take her place. And besides, it's so convenient being married to your income. You're the most selfish, the most (laughs) self-centered woman I've ever met. Am I, darling? You certainly are. Laura, all I ask is a divorce. I'll see to it that you're well cared for financially. No, Harvey. You're wasting your breath. I told you no yesterday. I say no again today. And I'll keep on saying no as long as I live. As long as you live. Yes. Just so, my dear. Just so. Frederica? Frederica, darling. Yes? Oh, oh, Laura. How are you? <laughs> Excellent, Frederica. I'm driving out to Cliff Point. Won't you ride along with me? We'll be back by noon. Oh, why, thank you so much. I, I would like the fresh air. Then come along, Frederica. I need some company, and besides, I want to have a little talk with you. Frederica! Laura! Laura, stop! Stop the car, for heaven's sakes! Laura! Good heavens, Frederica! She'll be killed! Here's your evening paper. Harvey Winstead's wife dead and plunge over Cliff Point. Two women forced off highway by unidentified truck driver. Mrs. Harvey Winstead killed instantly. Miss Frederica Keaton expected to die. There you are, folks. Get your evening paper. How is she, Doctor? How is Miss Keaton? She's uh, slightly improved, Mr. Winston. Thank heaven. She's still in a very serious condition. She regained consciousness early this morning after a ten days coma. She seems to recognize people, but something is wrong with Miss Skeeton's nerve centers. For one thing, she can't use her voice. An operation, perhaps? Yes, a very serious one. To require, well, quite an expense. Oh, hang the expense. Get the best surgeon you know of. I'll pay all the bills, everything. Only Frederica Keaton must recover. I say, Winstead, do you really think that that this girl will ever recover? I don't know. It's been months since the accident. She hasn't been able to speak one word to me. Now, look here, it's, it's none of my affair, really, but 
I know things have been going very badly for you lately. Losing your wife and all. But you need some money, old man. Oh, no, no. No, thanks. Thanks a lot, Rogers. My money's not completely gone. Yet. Good news. Good news, Wizard. Yes, Doctor? The operation was a success. <laughs> Believe me, I... I never dreamed it would require three operations to make Miss Keaton able to speak again. She can talk? Yes. After almost six months of silence. Oh, that's splendid. When can I see her, Doctor? Why, now, if you wish. Here. Uh, this way. Just... Just a few minutes now. She's... She's very weak. Yes. Hello, Frederica. Harvey. Harvey. Darling. Oh, my darling, at last. Isn't... Isn't it wonderful, dear? Oh, my dearest one. To hear your voice again. I... I thought I'd never speak to you again. You must forget all that, darling. Get well soon, please. Because just as soon as you're strong enough, we'll be married, dearest. Just as I've always told you we'd be. Oh, no. Wait a minute, Frederica. I want to carry my bride over the threshold. <laughs> Sweetheart. Up you come now. Yeah, yeah, there we are. Now. Yeah, there you are, Mrs. Winston, in your new home at last. Now, how about a kiss from Mr. Winston's new bride? Uh, Harvey, you're always the fool, aren't you? Frederica. Frederica, darling. Oh, stop it. Stop it. You're so annoying, Harvey. Frederica, whatever's come over you? You thought your problem was solved, didn't you? You thought sending me over the embankment to my death was a solution. I, I don't understand. Look at me. Whom do you see? Frederica Keaton, yes, of course you do. But whose voice do you hear? Laura. You've been so stupid, Harvey, you hadn't even noticed. It can't be. Are you a believer now? Laura, my wife. You have heard A Delicate Case of Murder, the 14th original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop. Georgiana Cook was heard tonight as Laura Winstead. Ben Morris was Harvey Winstead. Eleanor Naylor Corrin played Frederica Keaton. Muir Height was Rogers. And Fred Wayne was the doctor. Next Friday night at this same time, listen to the 15th unusual tale in this series of dark fantasy, Spawn of the Subhuman in which the nation's favorite soprano star makes an aeroplane flight to an incredible destiny that awaits her at the hands of a strange and mysterious madman. Tom Paxton speaking. Dark Fantasy comes to you from WKY, Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. There are, if 
For example, two distinctly divergent schools of thought on the question of whether there is an essential difference in kind between one entire group of mental disorders, which are called neuroses, and another, which we know as psychosis. Uh, Dr. Lincoln. Yes, Lee? Surely, in practice, this distinction is a useful and convenient one. I think we all should know that under its terms, neuroses are those disorders of emotional and also intellectual functionings with no loss of contact with reality. Psychoses, on the other hand, as, as you'll agree, Doctor, are... Uh... Lee, Lee. <clears throat> Yeah, There's yeah. a phone call for you. Tony Carpet has been knocked off. Narcotics wants you. What? Who's phoning? Johnny Bridges. All right, I'll come. Uh, if you'll excuse me, Dr. Lincoln, uh, gentlemen. Goodyear presents... The Sounds of Darkness. Good evening. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of passenger, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry, bring you Lee Masters, the blind detective who challenges the sounds of darkness. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, you will hear Tony Jay as Lee Masters, James White as Johnny Bridges, and Elaine Lee as Samantha Darlington. Others in the cast are Hugh Rouse, Brian O'Shaughnessy, and Gordon Mulholland. And now let's join the world of Lee Masters in tonight's Sounds of Darkness, The Smell of Death. Hello, Johnny. Sam. Hi, Lee. You got my message? Yeah, I got it, Johnny. During the lecture. Uh, Dry your eyes, Sam. All the crying in the world won't bring him back. Um, I'm sorry, Lee. I, I wasn't really crying. Oh, stop sniffling, then. I heard it the moment I came in. That's how I knew you were here. Sorry, honey, but take it easy. All right, Johnny. When, where, and why? Well, I don't know all that much about it, Lee. He was out on a case, as you know. Either a junkie or a wheeler got him. Broken neck outside a small speakeasy about an hour back. How long dead? Killed about four this morning. And he lay there outside until nine this morning? It seems so, Lee. It was a back china on 5th and 27th. Even if they saw anything down there, they wouldn't talk about it. You know how they love cops. Who's on it, Johnny? Neil Bates. He rang here. Wants your help. Mm. Feeling better now, Sam? Yeah, Lee. I I'm sorry. It's just that we've known Tony a long time, and, well, he was a nice guy. Oh, it all seemed so senseless. Yeah. I knew him about ten years. And ten years is a long time to live in narcotics. He could have got bumped off a long time ago. For, say, uh, about five years, Tony's been living on borrowed time. Look at it that way, Sam, and it won't hurt so much. Oh, gee, thanks, Lee. Uh, I'm sorry I'm so snivelly. Uh, you want me to get Bates for you? Uh, please. And a cup of coffee. Black, like Johnny's there on the table. Oh, Bates first or coffee, Lee? Coffee, Sam. Okay. Johnny, did they circle off the area? Yeah, Lee. 
Bates said to tell you it's being held that way until you look at the scene. Why not homicide? Uh, they're onto it as well, Lee, but this is narcotics, don't forget. FBI work. Our work, Lee. Plus the fact that Tony was an old friend, in a way. McDonald must miss him. He was one of Tony's takers. They shared an apartment and a mother. It's true. He's Tony's half-brother. As volatile, as precipitate as Tony ever was. But who killed him? A junkie? Denied a fix? Desperate? A wheeler? Stopped by Tony from selling the smoke? I wonder. It's not going to be easy, Lee. No. And when things aren't easy, look under the obvious. Even look inside a dead man if you have to. Uh, the, the perk's not working, Lee. I made you instant, okay? Thanks, Sam. No milk, just like I said. So, Tony Carpetti. You want to know something, Johnny? Something worth remembering? Death smells before it happens, as it's happening, after it's happened. Smells like burnt milk. Sharp. Acrid. Sam, get me Neil Bates, will you? the place. Oh, the guy that saw the body land out of here as quick as he could. Didn't touch thing. Okay, Johnny, tell me what you see. They're just this little alley, Lee, about 15 feet across. The stretch is from here to 28. About 40 yards at the most. Mm. High walls both sides, about 8 feet high. Garbage bins down the bottom, tarmac in the center of the alley. A bit of muck and gravel both sides for about uh, 2 feet in. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, Neil, the body... Uh, just about over here. Mm -hmm. That's where he found it. Was it found facing up or down? Facing down, Lee. Head, uh, my side, over here, this side. Okay, tell me about the prints, Johnny. Uh, two sets, Lee, close together, one small. Yeah, that would be Tony. He took size six. He was small, like his eye-type forebears. And? A bigger prints next to his, walking parallel... No, maybe a six-inch stretch behind the others. No, no more prints. The depression in the ground. So they were walking off the tarmac. Tony inside, right? Yeah, but how did you know? Tony was a careful man. He'd walk close to a wall any time. Well, let me see now. They walk together, then stop here. Yeah, let me feel... The larger prints circle round behind. That's how he was chopped down. By someone he knew. Who stopped with him in this alley. Probably asked for a cigarette. Took out matches. And dropped them behind Tony. And then he stood up. And struck with his fist at the back of the neck. Neck broke, eh? Tony dies. Now, look, Lee, this is all very clever, clever. Homicide can deal with this. I call you a trust. Give me a hand on the narcotic side, not to... There's a small depression here. <sighs> uh, it could have been a box of matches dropped by the killer. No, no, more likely a lighter. Uh, Neil, you were saying... Leave this to homicide, Lee. You and I got a lot to talk about. All right. Let's go to your office and talk. Was Tony still mucking about with women, by the way? Uh, no, I, I heard he'd stop that. I want to talk to your informant first. Then we'll go to your office. Take me to him, Johnny. I see. I see this small man, Ali. We have a talk. I remember him. He's the people come from Milano. Same as mine. He eats a hamburger, then he goes out. I did not see him again until I awoke out. I go through the alley to 28th Street to where I live. I see the body. I ring the police. Alice, mister. That is all I know. Take it easy. I believe you. He spoke to no one else? No, I am sure of that. Uh, no one at all. But he was killed by a man he knew. Okay, uh, Franco, if that's your name. You won't be booked. But I think the cops will want you to stick around. But uh, you are the cops, uh, mister. Yeah. 
once removed. Don't try and work it out. Neil, let's go. They haven't got the strangler yet, Lee. Should strike soon, so Kearney says. It's after the 24th. What does Kearney know about crime, Johnny? Or the phases of the moon? Or the meaning of killings on the 24th of each month? Well, he is the DA, and boy, are they kicking at him. Why don't the police safeguard the lives of every citizen? Why don't they do something about it? Yeah, I should hate to be in his shoes. Ah, the strangler's a nut. Did I get him in the end? No description, though. Clever nut. The way I admire him. Don't get me wrong on that, please. But he's bumped off four people. They can't even begin to find him. Admire a maniac, Neil? Possibly. Schizoids live in a world of their own. I can understand that. Is he schizoid, I wonder? Or just psychopathic? Hebrephrenic? Catatonic? Paranoid? Well, that's the killing stage. Lee, you've been attending FBI lectures again? Yeah. Doc Lincoln. He knows his stuff. Yeah, we're changing the subject. Any hunches on Carpetti yet? No, not yet. No hunches. Just a few deductions. He was onto something big, wasn't he? Yeah, heroin. Gonna crack it too, he thought. Yeah, he thought. <laughs> You don't mind our using your radio room like this, Bob? Well, no, sir. Glad to see you on the team. When's Johnny reporting in from the car? Should be any moment. He's watching Carter and McDonald, two of Tony's best boys. Trying to make contact with Tony's lead, huh? Yeah, that's right. Car 42 calling in. Car 42 calling in. Uh, come in, Pete. You got Lee Masters there. Johnny Bridges wants to talk with him over. Got him right here. Hold on. Okay, Lee, it's yours. Thanks. Johnny... Lee, we haven't got much. We're parked out of sight down here. The counter McDonald are on the corner. Now, I'm watching them like you said I should. This place was Tony's last connection with the drug boys, but nothing's happened so far. And those poor guys have been standing out in the rain for over two hours. Over. Right. Now, you check that speakeasy again? Yeah, Lee, nothing. Actually, Lee, we're in a bit of a fix. <laughs> Carter McDonald don't know who Tony made contact with. It's like working in the dark. Over. Uh, that's something I'm used to, Johnny. Now listen, he was onto something. Heroin, smoke. Someone was buying and squealing. Whoever squealed to Tony, if it happened that way, will still want his dough. Okay, keep looking, Johnny. Call me back in 20. Okay, Lee, we'll call. Over and out. You know, Bob, it's the wrong way round. What is, Lee? Who gets killed when someone squeals? The cop? Seldom. More often, the squealer by his own rats. But Tony gets slugged. And he's a big boy in narcotics, well known. Why? Yeah, it's odd, isn't it? Unless it... Oh, I don't know. I try to work it out since it happened. You got any hunches? No hunches, Bob. A deduction. The beginnings of a deduction. At a tangent. A rather crazy tangent, Bob. You are listening to The Smell of Death. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness brought to you by Goodyear, the greatest name in rubber. on duty. Yeah, Lee, he won't disturb us. You know, for someone so close to Tony, he seems mighty unconcerned. A uh, fatalist, maybe. They happen in our business. Yeah. You want me to check the bookcase again? And what about telling me what we're looking for? Now, just look for something small and innocent, Johnny. Nothing. Well, that painting's still in the middle of the wall. Tony always kept a painting. 
you know, reproduction old master, in the middle wall of this apartment. Yeah, it's still there. Johnny, if you were trying to hide something small in this place, where would you do it? Maybe behind that picture. Help me get it down, will okay. you? No, nope. nothing behind it, Lee. Cardboard at the back. Mm-hmm. We press down like this. Yeah, slight flat projection. And a slit in the cardboard above it. Get it out for me, Johnny. All right. Yeah, uh -huh. A diary? Right. All right, don't confirm it. He always kept a diary. Recorded his life in it, as it were. When Neil told me they'd found nothing, I... Read it to me, Johnny, slowly, from the beginning. Just this one, I Lee. Mm -hmm. 24th. I saw him. I know him. Someone close to me. Carter and MacDonald weren't with me this night, nor on the others. But I have seen him. Hmm. That's interesting, Johnny. Very interesting. Now, here's a lesson in observation for you. Take a well-known date. Attach to it something you've read about. Think of someone who attracts to himself that which he fears most. And think of someone who goes beyond the meaning the implication held in this diary. Ooh, that's a real Lee Masters puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, what's hi. Going on here? Oh, it's so delighted. I thought maybe the, the place had been broken into, huh? It's McDonald, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and do you got permission to bust into my apartment, huh? It was Tony's, too. Don't forget that. Sorry, McDonald. We were just putting out feelers. Oh, well, the guy's dead. Leave him be. All right, so we find his killer, then we think of friends. Uh, but leave him be. He was a great guy. Yeah, he was. An unhappy man? Unhappy? Well, he was happy. He's dead, that's all. All right, McDonald. Sorry we broke in. Yeah. Oh, well, that's all right. Forget it. Um, I could do with a rye. Uh, you won't join me, huh? No, no, no. We'll, uh, we'll be going. Homicide was told someone was in the flat. This is before McDonald gets to you. Ten minutes after you leave, homicide arrives. Thinking maybe a mob was breaking up the place. Why didn't you get my permission first? What are you doing anyway? Casing the joint? Like we told McDonald. Just checking, Neil. Well, don't check without me in the future, get it? Why so angry, Neil? Obsessed by something. I don't like being roasted by a half-baked, trumped-up chief of homicide. That's why. Well? Well, what, Neil? You know, you're confusing poor Sam. Aren't you going to... Can I apologize or something? All right. I apologize. Yeah. Well, I... I guess your men will leave, but for heaven's sake, let me know what you're doing, will you? Why didn't you phone through to me, Neil? Here at the office. Because I wanted to have it out with you myself. In person. I know you're the great Lee Masters, but to me, sometimes, you're just a... Yeah. No, you're, you're a great guy, Lee. I'm... I'm sorry. I'm... But head up about Tony's death, I... A break he was waiting for that just hasn't broken. I guess I've forgotten, too, how you work. I'm sorry. Forget it. No news from Carter or McDonald? Oh, no, nothing at all. You're sending Johnny out with him again? Yeah, tonight. Ah, if it's okay with you. I said I'm sorry. Don't rub it in. Lee, and uh, maybe Neil can explain the diary we found. Lee? Yeah. Uh, Neil, I, I was going to tell you about that. We found a diary in Tony's flat. You you said you weren't in there looking for anything, Lee. I wasn't looking for it. I knew it would be there. But there's nothing in it, really. Just a half page toward the end. Something about dates, seeing someone. I, I better take it with me, I guess. I'll give it to him, Johnny. No, okay. no, let me. Here, are, Neil. Thanks. Uh, your hand's shaking, Neil. You mustn't lose your temper so much. I, I'm getting on, that's all. Uh, palsy, you know. 
I'll hand this over to Baker, homicide, when I've gone through it. You do that, Neil. Okay, then I, I'll i be going. I'm sorry I bit your head off, Lee. Well, it's still there on my shoulders. Yeah, so long. Well, did I, I make a boo-boo giving him the diary? He's FBI, assistant head of narcotics. Wants to find Tony's killer. Wants Tony's contacts followed up. What do you think? Lee, and I don't know much about psychology, but that was an unnatural reaction of his. He's been dealing with the straight cops for years, so... Or perhaps he is getting old, impulsive, as he said. I was thinking about that conundrum you told me. Oh, yeah? Something I read about. Now, what's of particular interest recently? The Strangler. Now, that's step one. Uh A psychopathic killer may attract to himself what he fears most, being found out. Mm. Or the man who's able to find him out. So far, yeah, yeah, I keep going, Johnny. Yeah, now, someone who seems beyond the meaning of the dates in the diary. Someone untouchable. Someone not connected with the 24th. The 24th of the last four months. Someone known to Tony Carpetti, seen by Tony Carpetti, on the nights he was out on narcotics, but... But Lee, it, it can't be. It, it can't be. You know, mania is not found as often as we like to think, Johnny. Pure obsessional mania, that is. Without a schizoid imprint. Yeah, tension, irrationality, psychopathic mania. Johnny! Johnny, what are you getting at? It all points to one man, Sam. The man who shouldn't be suspected. The man who killed those people and Tony Carpetti. Neil Bates. What? Who killed Tony because... Because somehow Tony had found out. Are you out of your mind, Johnny? We've known Neil for years. Oh, Neil Bates, the famous strangler of nonsense. <laughs> Well, Johnny, you're doing all right. Except for one thing. Yeah? The strangler hasn't killed again. Think about that while Sam gets me a number. Sam? Uh Uh-huh? McDonald and Carter, Tony's takers. I'm going to ask them to meet us tonight. Then I'll ring Neil Bates. He'll be along, too. You're aiming for a dramatic show, Donny Lee? With those two along to help? We can do it on our own. Give me that number, Sam. Right. Uh, I'm... I'm waiting, Johnny, for someone to react. That's all. It'll happen tonight. Can you beat it? Neil Bates. Well, if he confesses with Carter MacDonald as witnesses, you've got him sewn up. wonder why I called you here tonight. And why here. Sense of the dramatic, I suppose. I know who killed Carpetti. At least I think I know. I could be wrong. Not you, Lee. Tony was a friend of mine. He wasn't onto anything big. He wasn't going to break a case like Neil here thinks. Oh, what was he up to then? You have to drag us down here to this warehouse to play the brain, Lee? Tony was up to something, in a way. He knew what was going on. Uh, what was that, Mr. Masters? He knew who the Strangler was. The Strangler who's been filling the city of New York with fear for the last four months. That's why he died. You, Carter, or you, Neil? Who killed Carpetti? Do you want me to tell you, or will you tell me? Now, look here, Lee. This has gone on long enough. Oh, Johnny, he's going for his gun. Leave him, leave him, Johnny. You little run back. You shut up, Neil. He was going for his gun, Lee. I was reaching for my handkerchief. You were what? It wasn't your fault, Johnny. I let you deduce a few things, but perhaps you don't know Dr. Lincoln, and that makes a difference. The answer to the poser? First, who killed on the 24th of the last four months? I'll tell you. Tony Carpetti. What? Oh, Lena. Oh, be... yeah, yeah, Isn't that Lee. right, McDonald? Uh, yeah. yeah uh, I heard some outside. I, I, I better go check. Uh, you, you see, uh, 
while, you know. Yeah. Look within a dead man, Johnny. Tony was the killer. But who killed Tony? The diary, the evidence, Neil here? Sometimes a psychopathic personality knows what he's done, though he feels no guilt. And such a personality can develop late in life. Lincoln again. Tony kept a diary. He knew he was an insane killer. The him referred to in his diary, himself. His other killing self. Yeah, I'll leave it. That still doesn't explain what you... Think of someone who might have been tainted, who feared in himself what Tony was doing. Tony, his blood relative. McDonald. McDonald! And there dies your killer. Don't ask me how he found out about his half-brother, but he did. And maybe he killed in self-defense. It was the 24th, remember. Maybe a mercy killing. Yeah, but Lee White killed himself. No, he could have stood trial, got up. Fear, Neil, of what he might one day do. All right, let's go collect the body. Oh, uh, tell me, you don't happen to smell something like, like burnt milk, do you? Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, presented for your entertainment by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of world-famous passenger tires, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry. Join us next Friday and every Friday night at 9.30 when Goodyear will again present the blind detective Lee Masters in... The Sounds of Darkness. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Lights out for the devil. And Mr. O. It is later than you think. Turn 
Turn out your lights now. We bring you stories of the supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly so that if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O.R. Jobler. We humans always think of the ultimate, the ultimate love, the ultimate happiness, ultimate security, ultimate peace. So, just to be fashionable, or perhaps with tongue-in-cheek, today I bring you another ultimate, and his title is The Whole. It all begins after a word from your station. And now, if you haven't already done so, turn off your lights and listen to The Whole. So, uh, I says to him, I says, well, sir, I'd like to be obliging, but I really haven't got the time. And he says to me, he says, well, Mr. Jackson, after all, we're making this proposition only to a few outstanding student representatives on the campus. And uh, we do feel that you should be interested in our proposition. Well, so, what did you say? Well, I said, mister, I can't be bothered. Just can't be bothered. And I gets in my car, off I go. But, Bob, free clothes just for wearing them around the campus. Listen, Stan, my boy, what I want to be a clothes horse for any old haberdashery? My old pappy's got more money than he knows what to do with. Now, what for, I ask you? Well, I guess you've got something there. Mm. Say, uh, who are you going to take to the dance Saturday night? Hmm, haven't made up my mind. How about that new number over at the Roto House? Ah, uh, no, thank you, brother. Well, what's the matter? Well, did you ever take a look at her feet? <laughs> no, sir, <laughs> never got below her chin. <laughs> oh, hold it. Yeah? A Ray Stewart to see you, Stan. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, send him on up. Ray Stewart? Who's he? Well, we're still short one pledge, aren't we? Oh, yeah, I know, but Ray Stewart, who is he? Oh, I met him over in chemistry. Got a mind like a textbook. Oh, but who is he? We can't pledge a man just because he's a grind. Well, we could use a few grinds around here. Exams come around, there's nothing like a few of those brainy boys to pull us through. But who is he? Where's he from? Who's his family? Who's his father? Hold it, hold it. Come on in, Ray. Oh, thank you. Oh, it was good of you to bother to come over tonight. It was good of you to ask me. Oh, not at all. Ray, I want you to meet the president of our house, Bob Jackson. Mr. Jackson, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I'm certainly glad to make your acquaintance. I might as well admit this is the first time I've ever been in a fraternity house. Really? Uh, sit down, Ray. Make yourself at home. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, tell me, Ray, uh, uh, do you ever go in for any sports back in your prep days? Oh, no. I never had much time for that sort of thing. No? No, I think that sports should be put into their proper place. After all, I'm sure you agree they aren't particularly important. No? And what might I ask is important in your estimation, Mr. Uh, uh, Stewart? Doing things. Being someone. What? Doing things man's never done before. Taking the elements and transmuting them into things which never existed until you thought of them. That, that's important. That's, that's being almost godlike, isn't it? Mister, are you tall? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I get sort of carried away. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Uh, Bob, uh, this boy sure knows his chemistry. Huh? Oh, I, I really don't know so much. Say, I ought to know better. You pulled me over some tough spots in this course. I, I'm very glad to help you whenever I can. If I lived here, I could help you all the time. I could help you too, Mr. Jackson. If I need help, I know where to get it. Oh, I, I didn't mean to it's, offend uh, you. It's all right, Stuart. Uh, now, uh, tell me, you're uh, you're from around Chicago way, aren't you? Oh, no, Milwaukee. Lived there for years. Nah, don't tell me I'm one of those Bruin families. <laughs> oh, no. We're not wealthy people at all. Uh. My father runs a small business. It, it isn't much, but we get along. Oh. I don't think money's important anyway if a person's ambitious... Do you, Mr. Jackson? Oh, no, no. <laughs> What's money? You fellas may think this funny, but... Well, I always thought it's more important what a fella does than what he has. I mean, well, I've always had the feeling that... Someday, somehow... I'm going to do something really important. Maybe even miraculous. Well, now, what do you expect to do? Discover the missing link? Uh, yes, Stuart. Uh, what is this miracle you expect to perform? Well, I... I don't know exactly... 
Ever since I've been just a kid, I, I've been interested in chemistry, and I, I've had a feeling that someday I'd, well, perform an experiment, mix certain chemicals together, and something would happen that never happened before. Now you hear that, Stan? A miracle man. Amazing, my dear Bob. Simply amazing. I know it sounds silly, but the things I dream about always seem to work out. Well, would you mind telling us the last miracle that worked out? Well, this. This? Well, what do you mean? Well, as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to belong to a fraternity, and here I am. I mean, you invited well, me. Well, just a minute there, fellow. <laughs> Mr. Stewart, it's been awfully nice of you to come over and visit with us, and someday we'll have you back again. Uh, but now we've got some studying to do, so if you don't mind... Oh, no, no, not at all. It was nice of you to invite me over. Well, good night, fellas. Good night. Good night. <laughs> All this girly crackpot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you see the look in his eye when he was talking about miracles? Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll be a miracle if he ever gets back into this house again, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what in the world ever made you ask him over here? Well, I didn't know. How was I to know he's a crackpot? <laughs> Pledge him to our fraternity. <laughs> Pledge him to the, the booby hatch. <laughs> Mr. Stewart, if you please, Mr. Stewart. Oh, yes, Professor? Mr. Stewart, might I ask if you're anxious to sever your relationship with this university? No, sir. Then might I ask why in creation you persist in ignoring my warnings? In this laboratory, you're to perform the experiments given you to perform. Understand? Given you to perform. Yes, sir. Then might I ask why you persist in your, shall I call it, original experiments? Perhaps it's your intention to blow up the university. Or just the laboratory. I'm sorry. You'll be more than sorry if I find you doing this sort of thing again. Now, take down this apparatus and continue with the work in your textbook. Yes, sir. This is my last warning, so bear it in mind. Oh, hello, Stuart. Um, how about loaning me your notebook for a few hours? Hmm? Oh, hello, Jackson. You, uh, you haven't been to lab much, have you? Oh, no, no, I haven't, but I can make it up. Well, uh, we've been pretty busy over the house. Initiations and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, Jackson. Yeah? You, uh, never invited me back. I... I thought maybe you forgot. Oh, well, you know how those things are. I... I wrote my mother that I was joining your fraternity. It... Well, that was a sap thing to do. Was it? Well, we hadn't pledged you. Stan simply invited you over so I could talk to you. But you said you wanted me to come back. Oh, now, look here, fella. Don't be stupid about this. We didn't pledge you, so that's that. And you're not going to pledge me? Certainly not. But why? I don't have to tell you why. But you've got to oh, tell me. Oh, quit pawing me, will you? All right, you're asking for it, so here it is. We didn't pledge you because we think you're a crackpot. A what? A crackpot. You talk about miracles. You spend every minute of your time here in the lab monkeying around with things you don't know anything about, getting yourself in all kinds of trouble. Yeah, and you look like a first-class screwball. But, but I'm just trying I to make... I don't care whatever it is you're trying. It isn't normal. I'll bet you never had a glass of beer in your life. And if a girl ever looked at you, you'd fall over in a faint. Then you're not going to pledge me? You're not going no, to pledge No, we're me. not going to pledge you. So if your mom expects you to be in a fraternity, you better start cooking up one of those miracles, fella. A first-class miracle. Sleep. It's so late. Sleep. Got to sleep. Not gonna pledge you. That's what he said. Not gonna pledge me. Why do I keep thinking about it? If I could only sleep. Sleep. We think you're a crackpot. Oh, I better stop thinking about these things. It's not healthy to think what I'm thinking. Crackpot. Not gonna pledge you. Crackpot. What's the matter with not my head? Crackpot. I heard him talking in it crackpot. over and over not and over again. Crackpot. I'm not crazy. Crackpot. I'm not. not I'm as good as you are. I'm as good as both of you put together. Crackpot. Stop crackpot. saying that. Stop crackpot. saying it. Crackpot. I'll show you. I'll show you both. Crackpot. I'm better than you are. I'm better than anybody. I'll show you. I'll give you miracles. The lab. I've got to get into it. I'll give you miracles. Dark in there. I've got to get in. Oh, blasted door. Got to get in. Window. I'll show you. It's so dark in here. I've got to find a lab table. I've got to make a miracle. <gasps> Who's there? Who's there, I say? Watchman. Come on now, who's there? Talk up. You don't have to get so excited. I, I'm a student. A student, eh? 
Let's have a look at you. That flashlight, you, you're blinding me. I've got to see who you are, don't I? Yeah, I know you. Seen you on the campus. I told you I'm a student. Well, that don't give you no right to be here after hours. How'd you get in here? Oh, broke a window now, did you, huh? I didn't break the window. But I heard the glass. So did I, and I followed the man in here. Man, what are you talking about? Give me your flashlight and I'll show you. All right. Here. Look behind you. Well, you're... <laughs> No one will stop me. No one. Miracle. I've got to make one. Got to. Got to. Got to. Ten cc barium. Five cc selenium oxychloride. Oh, good, good. You're working out just as I planned. Who's there? Who's that working there? Professor. Oh, oh, it's you, Stuart. And after all my warnings... You're just in time, Professor. Yes, just in time to have you thrown out of the university. What are you doing there? What is this mess of equipment? It's my miracle. Miracle? What are you talking about? My miracle. Are you insane? Take it apart, all of it, at once. <sighs> Listen to it bubbling. A beautiful sound, isn't it, Professor? Take it apart, I tell you. Empty out the retort. No. No, I've got to wait. Are you mad? Turn out the burners. No, all right, I'll turn them off for you. No. Stay where you are. Do it. Put down that acid. And I'll smash the bottle on your head if you touch anything no. on the table. No, don't throw it. Put the bottle of acid down, Stuart. Please. My experiment. My miracle. Bubbling and boiling and stewing. It will work, Professor. It's got to work. But but what is it? I told them I'd create something that no other man has. I told them. And I will, Professor. You hear me? I will. But but what? A solvent. A solvent more powerful than anything the world has ever known. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Listen to it, Bubble. You said solvent. Explain yourself. Yes, a solvent. Solvent that will dissolve steel like a hot flame. What do you say? You heard me say it. A solvent that will dissolve steel faster than a razor cutting through paper. Do you know what that means? Well, uh... Run a line of this liquid across a steel girder, and the girder will crumple like a falling tree. Pour some of my solvent into a glass shell and bomb the cities. I tell you, it'll make war too horrible for men to endure. Uh, you, you crazy boy, you. You know what you're talking about? I'm talking about that. That liquid there. Listen to it. Listen to it sing. Why, no such solvent exists. Selenium oxychloride, perhaps, but to do the impossible things you talked about would require a quantity so... Oh, the beaker. It cracked. Well, do something. That liquid's flying all over my bench, my laboratory. The stone of the bench. It's eating through the stone. Well, stop it. The liquid. It's eating through the stone bench. No. No, it can't be. It's eating through the slate of the floor. The hole's getting bigger and bigger. Run. Run. Oh, I've done it. I've created something no other man has done. A solvent that dissolves anything. 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 Hey, what happened? What's the matter? The lamp. I guess it's on fire. Well, where's the fire? I can't see anything. The whole school's out here. Hey, hey, fellas, what's up? Well, nobody fire. seems to know. Something's going wrong in the lab. The fireman won't let us in. Something burning? I don't know. Can't get near enough to find out. Well, I can't see any fire. There's plenty of smoke going. Plenty of excitement. Read about it in tomorrow's paper, I'll bet you. Hey, listen to that sound. Yeah, sounds like water. Gosh, what is it? Hey, everybody what? back! What? Hey, back. Hey, the building! It's got a crash! Run! 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 I did it. I did it. A solvent that dissolves anything. Anything. We leave our The Devil and Mr. O story of The Hole for a welcome breath and a necessary message from your station. And now back to The Devil and Mr. O story of The Hole. Hey, Chief, Chief, look at this. Mm -hmm. What's the matter, Murph? Somebody have sex doublets? Get a load of this, Chief. Came in over the news wires. Read it. Yeah. Additional on Whitmore University. Mysterious cavity on campus growing larger hourly. More followers. <laughs> Mysterious cavity. Hey, what is this, a dentist at Wordy Middle? Don't you remember, Chief? A couple hours ago, that flash about something eating a hole so big, a building fell in it. This is the follow-up. The thing's getting bigger. What do you want to do about it? Forget it. What? Don't you see through a gag when it hits you in the face? Somebody's just having fun on the wires. Ha! Mysterious cavity growing bigger. 
Well, when it's as big as a hole in your head, that'll be news, Murph. That'll be news. Anything. It dissolves anything. And I did it. I discovered it. I discovered it. Yes, 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 yes. Hello. What is it? Yes, yes, this is Dr. Whitmore. Who is this? Who? National News Service. Now, look here, my good man. It's four o'clock in the morning, and I'm supposed to be resting. My vacation, you know. What? My university. Building collapsed. But, but are you sure? No, no, I can't give you any sort of statement now. Hang up, man. I've got to get the operator. 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 Give me long distance. Give me... What? Long distance is calling? Well, put them on. Put them on. Hello. Hello. Yes, this is he. Rogers? Yes, Rogers. What? He did? That's impossible. Larger? But how could it grow larger? Chemicals? Are you drunk men? Insane? It's impossible. Impossible. But you must do something. Something. Listen, mister. I'm a fireman, not a magician. But that pole, it's 20 feet wider than it was 10 minutes ago. Mister, I don't know what it's all about. No fire and the ground's burning right away. We have $5 million worth of property on this ground. If that holds for any... For sake, leave me alone, will you? We've been throwing water on the edges of the thing ever since the building fell in, but it don't do no good. It don't do no good. Gentlemen, listen to this out of tonight's paper. The latest news on the Whitmore University mystery. What at first was treated lightly by all newspapers as either a hoax or a shifting of earth stratum has now developed into an authentic yet unbelievable situation. The hole which began at the site of the chemical laboratory building is now 300 feet in diameter and spreading with unbelievable rapidity. Fire departments and fire experts from all neighboring communities within a radius of 100 miles have been called in but have been helpless to combat the rapidly spreading pit. Many conflicting theories have been propounded as to the cause of the cave-in, but at last reports, nothing definite had been determined. That's the, enough, the... Professor Parker. What about the solvent? Yes. Yes. What about Unbelievable, the... unexplainable as it is, it is apparently self-regenerating and oxidizing anything it comes in contact with so quickly that we see no fire but only the rapidly growing cavity where the earth is being consumed. Right. But, but, Professor Parker, Parker what is this solvent? Surely you don't expect us to believe that this student you were telling us about... I mean cause... exactly that. Oh, preposterous. It's a fault in the structure of the earth. There is no such thing as a self-regenerating solvent. Simple cave-in, that's all it is. Gentlemen, gentlemen, if you please, what I know, I know. Oh, it's preposterous. Oh, gentlemen, if you please, if my professional reputation is not enough to substantiate what I've said, then at least you'll listen to the boy himself. He's here. Listen to him. Well, why should we? Yes, gentlemen, if you'll listen, I'll tell you. You'd better listen to me. Gentlemen, please. What Professor Parker said is true. It is a solvent. It dissolves anything it touches quickly, furiously. And the byproducts of that dissolution give it new strength and movement. And I discovered it, gentlemen. I. I know, but what will happen? What can we do? We can wait. Wait? Wait? How can we wait? Look out there. The hole's within two feet of another building already. You've got to stop it. At once. If Look, you do The building. The foundations are the mines. Crashing. Harris Hall, caved right in the hole. Professor Parker, you boy, listen. Which chemicals did you use? We've got to fight it with chemicals. Spread them around the edge. Neutralize this solvent. Yes, yes, that's it. Chemicals will neutralize the reaction. No, gentlemen. Listen, listen. You may neutralize the reaction at the edges of the hole, but you forget one thing. What? What are you talking about? The solvent is eating downward at many times the rate it's eating outward. You may neutralize the reaction at the edges of the hole. But have you forgotten? It's eaten the hole a quarter of a mile deep already. And it's eating into the earth faster and faster. <laughs> How are you going to stop that? How are you going to stop that? Faster, faster and faster at an ever-increasing rate, this strange cancer on the surface is eating away. It is now approximately 14 hours since the phenomenon began, and already it has eaten outward a distance approximately one mile in diameter, with a resulting damage of over a million and a half in property. Truly, the most astounding factor in this catastrophe is the fact that the hole is increasing in depth at an unbelievable rate. 
At our last reports, approximately ten minutes ago, the pit had reached a depth of approximately three miles, and experts apparently refuse to predict how much further this earth cancer will go. What only a handful of hours ago was a quiet section of the country in which stood the Whitmore University is now a great gaping pit in the surface of the earth out of which rise strange noxious gases as that burning something eats deeper and deeper and deeper into the bowels of the earth. The latest sonic recordings indicate that the shaft has now reached a depth of 11 miles, 2,342 feet. I'm right on the scene and will continue to send reports as quickly as... Sure is a crowd here. Yeah, half million, they say. Yeah, watching and, and waiting. And for what? Ain't it ever going to stop, Stan? Don't ask me. I don't know. It's going deeper and deeper every minute. There ain't no stopping it. Listen to them. Scared, ain't they? Every one of them. Well, aren't you? Yeah, sure. That hole going deeper and deeper into the ground and nobody can stop it. And what happens when it gets all the way through, nobody knows. Sure, I'm scared. Scared plenty. Earthquake. Help, send help. Volcano erupting. City on fire. Martial law declared. Tidal waves sweeping inland. Nothing can stop it. Nothing, nothing. Earthquake. Fire. Tidal waves. We're coming to an end. Judgment of God. Judgment of God. From Siberia to Cape Town to San Francisco and around the world again. I tell you, the earth's ripping apart. And I tell you, it's that hole in the ground that's done it. It's affected the rotation of the earth. Unbalanced things. Yes, and it's biting deeper every minute. What'll happen when it eats through to the other side? The ocean pouring through. We'll die. We'll all die. Who's to blame? Who's to blame? Who's to blame? It's that kid who's to blame. Yeah, we read it in the papers. That crazy yeah. college kid. There. There he is. Yeah. That's him. That's him. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, that's him. No, no, let me go, you fools, you. I've done a great thing, a wonderful thing. Created something no one ever thought of. No, let me down. Let me down. Let me down, you fools. I started the song, but I didn't know this would happen. You can't blame me for a miracle. Throw him in the hole. No. Yes, throw him no. in the hole. He made it. No, don't throw me down in here. There's no bottom to it. No, no. Here. Here, put him down here on the grass. Dan? Yes. Boy, oh boy, will this be a sensation on the campus. But, Watchman, how did it happen? Well, me, I'm making my rounds of the grounds as usual, and all at once in the moonlight I see this fellow walking across the grass. So I go up to him and I see the fellow's walking in his sleep. In his sleep, sleep yeah. yeah. And just when I start to grab him easy-like, he pulls loose, yells something about, don't throw me in, don't throw me in. And then he runs across the campus and dives headfirst down into the swimming pool. And it's empty. When I pull him out, he's... He's like he is now. Busted neck. Well, well, I I did, but uh, who is he? Anyone recognize him? Yeah. Yeah, I know him. Stewart's his name. Ray Stewart. Kind of a screwy little crackpot. Always talking about creating miracles with chemicals. I wonder what he thought was happening to him diving down that hole. This is Mr. O, Arch Obler. Listen, if you expect me to talk about large excavations, I'm just not going to do it. Instead, I'd much rather talk to you about your living forever. Of course, that's after a word from your station. This is Mr. O again. To live forever, to never die, to know immortality, do you want that? Then listen with me to our next play, Live Forever, and let's decide together whether we want an infinite number of birthdays or ultimate peace. Next time, then, Live Forever. It is later than you think.
In 2025, neutron bombs wipe out much of the world's drinkable water. For the next several years, survivors exist in deplorable conditions and their rations are dwindling. One woman arises from the camp, determined to improve conditions. Charlotte is ready to do whatever it takes to ensure clean water for her fellow survivors. Water is almighty. Whoever controls the water rules the world. Can Charlotte prevent the power from falling into the wrong hands? Weird Darkness Publishing presents Working for H2O by Sarah Faith, now available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions on Amazon and at WeirdDarkness.com. The Diary of Fate. Fate plays no favorites. It could happen to you. Book 63, page 397. In the Diary of Fate. Joe Mattock. Occupation, truck driver. An honest endeavor, and one which requires strength and endurance. It was work well suited to you, Joe Mattock. You were robust, strong, and courageous. Life could have been good, but you were impatient. And then I, fate, intervened. At just the wrong moment, a traffic light changed and confronted you with an opportunity, a temptation which struck at your weakest point. Yes, because a traffic light changed, your life will be utterly destroyed. Take heed, you who listen, lest you think me unjust. I am not cruel. Not unmindful of mortal rights. But soon it will be time for a further entry under the name Joe Mattock. When I have written, I will read from his page in The Diary of Fate. <laughs> can penetrate the dark curtain of the future, even as the mind of Joe Maddock could not foretell what the few hours of one night would bring when he yielded to temptation and gave free rein to his impatience. He could not tell where it would end as he stood on a third floor fire escape and struggle for a precious black bag. Try to double-cross me, will you? I'll show you, you cheap no good. No, Joe, I... stop it. Give me that bag. Oh, oh. Give it to me. Turn loose of it, or I'll break your oh, arm. Joe, please. Come on, turn oh, loose of it. Joe, 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 give it to me. Joe, Joe, Joe. Yes. In that instant, Joe Maddock, your life became a churning maelstrom of horror. And now you know too late that if your choice be for evil, the end is inevitable. For that is all part of a plan. And I, fate, am but the instrument. And the little things, the trifles of life, are the tools with which I work. Remember, Joe Maddock, how it all started? You were leaving on your regular run to Morristown. And you'd picked up a hitchhiker, a girl, and you conversed easily with her as you drove through the traffic toward the suburbs and the open highway. 
same, so Tuesday night it was a bust, and I pitched the next morning with a fresh guy from Buffalo, and I knew. Hmm? That's the story. By the way, I'm Bell Sheldon. What's your name? Joe. Joe Maddox. I'm out of Morristown, and that's as far as I'll be able to take it. Oh, every little bit helps, Joe. You know, hitchhiking's kind of tough for a girl. <laughs> Too many Romeos? Oh, that. And they figure women spell trouble. You married? Married and working at it. Ah, I've got a beautiful wife. Oh, uh-huh, you should be. You're easy to look at. How often are you with her? Oh, every third day. That's the only thing I don't like about this job. You see, the pay's good and the work. Well, I'm built for it, but... But I you don't... don't like being away from the missus so much, and with the amount of cash you stock away each week, it'll be six or seven years before you can get a truck of your own and have a business going. Yeah, that's it on the button. How'd you know? Oh, you're not the first truck driver I've hitched with. It's an old story, Joe. It's a sad one. What do you mean? It doesn't work, believe me, Joe. I've been around. You get no place that way. You plan, you mark time, and then... All of a sudden, you're old. Oh, what's your answer? Me? Well, you've got life figured out. I have to keep my eyes open, wide open, Joe, and sooner or later an opportunity comes along, and then, brother, I move, and I move fast. Hey, what's that traffic signal for? Town of hit? No, that's U.S. 12 out of Carsburg. Busy road. Maybe we'll make the light. Mm, nope. Turn red. We lose, Joe. Yes, Joe Maddox, a little thing happened. I, fate, moved my hand. And at just that instant, a traffic light turned red. You stopped. But before you started again, a man approached carrying a coat and a black overnight bag. He asked you for a ride. Bell didn't mind being crowded, and you gave the stranger a lift. Ten minutes later, as the truck rolled along the even highway, he was fast asleep. Oh, great conversationalist you picked up. He's sound asleep. Oh, in that case, you'll have to talk for two. Tell me, Bill, what do you think... Joe, look out that car! Crazy drunk. What happened? That was too close. Huh? A pint of whiskey and some guys figure they're supposed to straddle a white line. Here, mister, you dropped your bag. Uh, Give me that. Hey, Hey, easy, brother. She was doing you a favor. Uh, it opened. Sure you didn't lose anything? Oh. No, I didn't lose anything. Sorry I got rough with you, lady. It's all right. Forget it. There's a chow wagon at Cedarville around this next curve, Bell. Shake Sleeping Beauty maybe he wants some coffee. Coffee's a good idea. Hey, Beauty, wake up. Huh? Huh? What's wrong? Ah, uh, nothing. We're just going to stop for some jabber. Yeah. Say, what's your name, fella? My name? Nick. My name is Nick. Nick what? Nick uh, Nodella. Well, here we are. Chuck's Chuck Wagon. The best coffee and the worst food between here and the coast. You can leave your bag and coat in a cab, Nick. They'll be safe. Uh, thanks, but I'll take this stuff with me. Hey, this is quite a little town. Yeah, Cedarville's all right. Kind of quiet, though. Come on, I'm hungry. Let's go, Nick. According to CR Matt, the chairman of the committee, the university will enlarge our program. You know, I might have a state to go with that cup of coffee. What about you, Bill? I'll buy if you're broke. Mm-hmm. Thanks, I'll pay my own way. Now, there's a table, Joe, in the corner. Oh, let's keep a Nick. Carsburg, in a I don't know. Daylight hey, the radio, Carsburg listen, Jack. The National Bank was robbed of more than $100,000. Three men, armed and wearing handkerchiefs over their faces, entered the bank shortly before closing time this afternoon. They overpowered the bank guard at one teller and got away in a waiting car. No description was gotten of the men, and the police believe that they split up before leaving Carsburg. And now, the last minute... Joe, come here. Joe, where's Nick? Nick? Outside, I guess. Why? What's the matter? His bag, Joe. I saw what he's carrying when it dropped and it opened. Joe, it's filled with money. What? Money, Joe. Do you understand? It's full of money. For a 
moment, Joe Mattock, you were stunned. Then slowly the full implication of Belle's words struck you. You quickly followed her out of the restaurant, but Nick was nowhere in sight. Then you thought of the bus station, and you ran across the street and searched the small building. He's not on station, Belle. We better call the police. Don't be a fool, Joe. Nick Nadella has a hundred grand, or a good part of it, in that little black bag. We're going to get it, Joe. You and me. I told you that sooner or later opportunity comes along. Shh. Quiet, Belle. There he is. Over in the shadow of the truck. You sold me on it, Belle. We're partners. Come on. Hey, Nick, you going to have coffee? What? No, no, I changed my mind. Hey, you uh, didn't miss a thing, go. Nick. Strictly mud. Hey, uh, Joe, any objection to my sleeping in the back for a while? I'm, I'm beat, dead tired. Oh, suit yourself. That gives us more room up in front. Here, I'll open it up. Uh, Got your coat and stuff, Nick? Uh, yeah. How far are you going, Joe? Morristown. I'll wake you up when we get there. Okay, thanks. Let's get rolling, Bill. Uh -huh, I'm all for it. Now that we've got our pigeon cooped up. I tell you, Joe, it's simple. As soon as you get to a crossroad, kind of an open spot where we can see cars coming in either direction, you take motor trouble. Then get Nick out of the back to help you. Will we go for that? Oh, sure. He's anxious to get out of here. Give him a screwdriver to hold or something while you turn the motor over. Then when he gets around in front, just slip the truck into gear. And Nick Nadella is a hit-and-run case. Yeah, it'll work all right. Uh, we got to remember to throw his coat out, too. The coat, yes, but not the little black bag. No, Bell. We'll keep the little black bag. <laughs> All right, Joe. No cars in sight. Right. I can't figure the trouble, Bell. I'll get Nick to give me a hand. Okay. Hey, Nick! Nick! Wake up! Huh? Uh-oh. We in Morristown already? No, it's motor trouble. I need your help. Oh, I, I don't know anything about motors. You don't have to. Just hold a screwdriver where I show you. Okay. Let's get it over with. Here, hold a flashlight, Bell. You and Nick touch the screwdriver here. No, no, you got to get it in closer. Uh, uh, get around front. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Now I'm going to race the motor. Uh, don't worry if there's a spark. It can't hurt you. It's all right, Joe. I don't scare easy. Good. Now we're all set. Okay, we got to move fast now. That's it. Bell, get the bag. Joe! Joe, the bag is gone! <laughs> Yes, Joe. The bag was gone, and the man was dead. Because of a little thing, a red traffic signal, you had committed murder. Soon, Joe Mattock, I will write another entry under your name in The Diary of Fate. Dark of night on a lonely highway, a man lay dead, killed by you for a black bag full of money. And now, that money was gone. What are you talking about? That bag's got to be there. Come and look. It's not here, I tell you. Well, then where is it? He had it when he got him back here, didn't he? I thought so. He was holding his coat over his hands. I figured the satchel was under the coat. Those doors weren't open until we stopped right here. They can't be open from the inside. What did he do with it? How'd he get rid of now, it? Now, wait a minute. You think. Plus, if we can't hang around here forever, we've got to get going. If anybody sees him under there, why, we're through. I know it. Keep your shirt on. Look, something was funny about him walking across the street back there in Cedarville and then showing up at the truck again. Well, come on. We've got to get out of here. Joe, wait. I've got it. I'll bet anything I'm right. Come on, help me. What? What are you going to do? We've got to search his pocket. Search him? What for? Maybe he's got a baggage check on him. He could have checked that satchel in the bus station at Cedarville. Yeah. 
You're right. There's nothing here. Pull this, Carter. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So here it is. Look. Come on. I'm pretty smart on it, checking that bag. Nobody coming, does it? I hope we get out of sight before they find Stop it. Stop worrying. We cash this in, we're set. Now, look. Got any idea how we're going to get back to Cedarville? Yeah, that's easy. We'll pick up my car at home and drive back. But I got to get this load delivered first. What about your wife? Well, we'll go to the house and get the car first. Then I'll call Molly from downtown and tell her I've got to go right back on some kind of a job for the company. She'll take it all right. Okay, Joe. Sounds good. By tomorrow morning, you can go your way and I'll go mine. But the roads won't be nearly so rough. Right, Joe? Right, Bell. As the heavy truck roared toward Morristown, Joe, you did not feel like talking. It was one o'clock in the morning when you backed the truck against the loading platform of the Morristown Freight House. And a half hour later, Bell waited in your car while you called your wife from the all-night drugstore. Molly, this is Joe. Honey, I've got to go back to Cedarville. Yeah, right away. Well, one of the trucks had a breakdown and... Huh? Oh, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow. I was going to leave a note for you, but I forgot. Yeah. Okay, honey. Yeah. Bye-bye, baby. You sure a good driver, Joe. We were in made time. Yeah. It's only 20 minutes after 3. I think I'll park along here. We can walk over to the bus depot. Unless you want to wait in the car. No, I'll I go... Uh, go along. As a matter of fact, Joe, if there are any questions, I might be able to get it easier than you. I could say I'm his wife or something. Yeah, I guess you're right. Oh, you go ahead and get her. I'll wait outside. Okay, Joe. Be right back. Come on, Val. Get in the car. Hurry up. Okay. Joe, this is it. I got it. Well, come on. Open it up. Let's see. All right. Just a second. Joe. Look. Look. Holy smoke. It's full. Bundles of bills. They're all tens and twenties. Joe, it's a fortune. Yeah. Oh, here. Let me see it. Wait a minute. We've got to decide something. Where are we going to split this up? Oh, we could drive out someplace. That's no good. Somebody might see us. We've got to be careful now. Look. Let's go to a hotel and I'll get a room. We'll divide it up there. Gotta be right, Joe. Fifth and fifty. At the hotel, Bell registered and was given a room on the third floor. And then I, fate, again intervened. And another little thing happened. You, Joe, stopped to light a cigarette. And you missed the elevator. When it came down again, it carried a friend of yours, a truck driver who was staying overnight at the hotel. It was impossible to avoid him, but you cut the conversation short. And a few minutes later, you followed Bell down the hall to room 314. 312, 314. Here it is, Joe. Come on in, Joe. Slip the chain on the door. Okay. Who was the guy downstairs? Oh, just another truck driver. Sure bum luck running into him here. Stop worrying, will you? In ten minutes, you'll be on your way home. A very rich man. Yeah. Well, let's get started. Put the stuff on the table and we'll divide it All up. All right. Just a second. I want to open this window a little. It's stuffy. Ah, oh, there. Now, let's get it all out of the bag and lay it on the table. Hmm, and we can count it. Yeah. Oh, gee, Bell, look at it. Why, well, there must be a hundred thousand bucks here, at least. Boy, those guys downstairs would go nuts if they saw this. Joe, wait. Oh, what's the matter? Quiet. Did you hear that? I didn't hear anything. Outside the door. There's somebody out there. I heard them. What? Well, here, ditch this stuff back in the bag. I'll take a look. Wait a minute. There. Okay. There's nobody out here. Look again. Take a good look. Okay, but I... Hey, what what the... Get out! What the devil? Bell! Bell! Oh, 
Bell, let me in. What are you doing? Beat it, sucker. You want the cops up here? Bell, open this door. Bell, I'll bust it open. Bell. All right, then. Bell, what? The money. So that's it. Oh, a fire escape. Come back here, you. Try to double cross me, will you? I'll show you, you cheap little no good chisel. Don't stop it. Stop Give it. Give me that bag. I won't. Give it to me. Turn loose of it or I'll break your arm. Oh, don't, please. Look out, I'm slipping down. Turn loose of it. Give it to me. No, I'm slipping down. For a horrified instant, you stared down at Bell's crumpled form, lying dead in the alley, three stories below. <laughs> Then, as the crowd began to gather, you clutched the black satchel and quickly climbed to the roof of the hotel. As you jumped to the adjoining roof, you heard your friend in the crowd calling your name. You ran down a fire escape and dashed to your car. Seconds later, your tires screeching, you turned south, away from Morristown. Behind you, a police siren wailed. Bella's dead. I killed her. I can't go home now. I've got to drive. Drive fast. They recognize me. I made a hundred and fifty miles. No sign of the cops. Maybe I can stop here for coffee. Better take the bag along. Latest reports of shock and murder in Cedarville last night where an unidentified woman was hurled three stories to her death from a hotel fire escape by a truck driver named Joe Mack. When last seen, he was driving south on Highway 43 in a blue 1942 automobile convertible, license number 38491. I'm getting tired. Driving all night and all day. Gotta stop and rest soon. Maybe they won't know me in this town. Maybe I can get some sleep. I can... Cops spotted me again. I gotta go fast. I'll shake them. I'll turn. Oh, too fast. I'm skidding. Come on, you're gonna make it. Fire. I'm on fire. Gotta get out. No, no, the bag. The bag of money. There now, I got, I got to get out. Get out and run. Yes, Joe, your car crashed and burst into flames. But you got out. And you got the bag of money out, too. But only at the expense of bad burns on your face and hands. You ran into the railroad yards and boarded a freight train. Finally, days later... And hundreds of miles away, you changed your name, bought new clothes, and had your burns treated. You were scarred and disfigured from the fire. Now, no one could recognize you. And you had more than $100,000 in cash to start your new life. Take heed, you who listen, lest you think fate is a conspiratory evil. In a few moments, I will write the final entry in the record of Joe Mattock. When I have written, I will read from the Diary of Fate. up everything. Your wife, your name, your honor, and even your handsome face for a black bag filled with money. Now you were John Warren, a man with a scarred face and a fortune. Yes, your new life was going to be quite enjoyable, you decided, as you sat in your new apartment after a day of lavish spending.
Good evening. Are uh, you Mr. John Warren? That's right. Ah, mind if we come in? Well, certainly. What's on your mind? Well, uh, we got something to talk over with you. Now, uh, Mr. Warren, what's your real name? Real name? What do you mean? Who are you? We're the police. You birds always work under an alias. What's your real name? Why, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, uh, doesn't make any difference. We'll take your fingerprints when we get down to headquarters, and then we'll find out who you really are. You, uh, spent quite a tidy piece of change today, didn't you? Yes. What's wrong with that? It's my money. I'll say it's your money. We traced it all back here to you. Hey, what's this all about, anyway? I'm glad you admitted it was your money, Mr. Warren. You see, every dollar you spent today was counterfeit. Yes, Joe. The money you had sacrificed everything for was counterfeit. If you had taken time to read a newspaper, you would have known that the bandits who robbed the Carsburg Bank were captured and the money recovered. You would also have known that a notorious counterfeiter was found dead on the highway near Cedarville. But you didn't. And so the bag of money that you thought would bring a rich new life brought only disgrace and death. And now it is time to close the book. Another entry has been duly noted on the pages of eternity. And justice has been served. In the case of Joe Mattock, as in the cases of all mortals, it was the little things which determined the ultimate outcome. Because I, fate, caused a traffic light to change at the right moment, Joe Mattock was faced with the decision that he chose for evil. And because he stopped to light a cigarette and missed an elevator, he was recognized by a fellow truck driver. The result of an evil choice was certain, brought about by the little unnoticed things which are my instruments. Ponder well the moral, you who listen, and remember that there is a page for you in The Diary of Fate. The cast included Frank Albertson, Gloria Blondell, Herbert Lytton, Jerry Hausner, Ray Erlenborn, Ivan Dittmars, and Hal Sawyer. This is a Larry Finley transcription, brought to you from Hollywood. No matter the time of day or season, 
Sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X, 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 X. To all our listeners, a brief forward before tonight's adventure in the world of the future. Beginning next week, Dimension X moves to a new time on Friday evenings instead of Saturdays. In the Eastern Time Zone, it will be heard at 9 o'clock Friday's Eastern Daylight Saving Time. In other zones, please consult your local newspapers to learn the new time of the program. Now, tonight's venture into the world of tomorrow. A most unusual story about a logic named Joe and a man named Frank and of how he saved civilization. It was on the third day of August that Joe came off the assembly line. On the fourth, Lorene came into town. And that afternoon, I saved civilization. Lorene's a blonde I was crazy about once. And Joe was a new 1940-74 model logic that I got stored away down in a cellar. And how do I save civilization? I save it by keeping Joe down in a cellar. Sometimes you are listening now Joe to a on, voice from the future. The voice of Frank Caldwell, head serviceman for the Logics Corporation. Makers of the machine that does everything for you. Well, nearly everything, anyway. In the year we speak of, 1974, the electronic logic sets were working so well that life was soft indeed for repairman Frank Caldwell. That is, until that fatal day of August the 3rd, when suddenly the logics began doing everything for their users and doing it too well. Hi, boss. What's the matter? Somebody put you through a ringer? Uh, Frank, you busy right now. No, oh, there haven't been any service calls all day. Fine, there's a customer outside. Go take care of him, will you? Me? I'm a maintenance man. I know, but there are no salesmen around this minute. This guy wants to have our machines explained to him. Explained? Yeah. Everybody in the world knows about logics. Where's he been, on Mars? Just moved up from the backwoods someplace. Why don't you explain him? I, I don't feel too well. Yeah? You're okay about a half an hour ago. Look, you the boss here or am I? Go on out there, okay, will you? Okay, okay. Good morning. My name's Caldwell. Can I help you? Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Caldwell. My name's Kalanovich. Uh, this is my little boy, Freddy. Hiya, Freddy. Hiya, jerk. Oh, oh, Freddy. I got well, you, you, didn't I? <laughs> Fine kid you got there. Freddy, how many times I got to tell you not to kick people in the shins? <laughs> Excuse it, please, Mr. Caldwell. Sure, He's... sure. Just a kid. I got yeah. a knife home. Can cut you in little pieces. Freddy... We, we'd like to buy a logic, Mr. Caldwell. The gentleman we spoke to first said he had to leave in a hurry. Oh, he did, huh? Well, I understand you're not acquainted with logics, Mr. Kralanovich. Yeah, that's right. We just moved to the city. My wife, she saw that everybody else had a logic, and <laughs> you know how women are. You bet, you bet. Well, you can't get along without a logic in this day and age, Mr. Kralanovich. Look at I got a snake. Want to see Will it? You shut up that... Uh, yeah, now, about the logic. Yeah. Here, I'll plug one in here. There, now. 
You see, the logic looks kind of like an old-fashioned television set, only it's got keys instead of dials. Mm. Now, if you want to talk to a friend, yeah. you just punch the number of his logic. Huh. Like making an old-fashioned phone call. Except you not only hear him, but you see him, too, on this viewing screen here. Now, of course, that's not the important feature of these things. Oh? Now, uh, suppose you want to ask a question. Uh, a question? Like, uh, what to take for a sore throat? Or who won the American League pennant in 1911? You just turn on the logic. Then you punch the question key, and you ask, like this. Who was the first president of the United States? George Washington. You see? I already knew that. Well, that was just a sample. Oh. Well, I got a little store. Will it keep books for me? It'll keep your books, record your contracts, serve as a filing system, and check up on what happened to your lawyer's last client. Anything. Oh, say, they're really something, these things. 10,000 services and information sources in one. Read our advertising. Well, what I want to know, Mr. Caldwell, how do these logics work? You saw that big building across the street? Sure. Well, that's one of the relay tanks. Now, there are a dozen of them around the country, all hooked up together. And there's a data plate in one of those tanks for every fact in creation. You mean those relays know everything? If there's something they don't know, the technicians are busy making a relay play, it, play for it right now. The logic integrates the facts in the tank and gives you the answers. Hey, you. Can I ask this thing how to make dart poison? How to make what? Dart poison, like in Africa. I could shoot the darts from my pea shooter. Oh, well, maybe... I think maybe we better not get one of these things. Well, that's okay, Mr. Kulanovich. The logic won't tell you about no dart poison, see? You bet it will. I'm gonna try it. <laughs> hey, how do you make dart poison? Public policy forbids this service. Ah, uh, what'd it do that for? On account of some little brat, on account of some children might ask things that ain't good for them. Listen, I don't like this here one. I want that one over there. They're all alike, kid. I want that one. If I can't have that one, I'm gonna hold my breath till I'm dead. Well, I got lots of time. It's no use, Mr. Caldwell. You might as well give him the one he wants. But, kid, they're so much alike. Even I can't tell them apart. I can't, and I want Joe. Joe? Who's Joe? Oh, I guess he means the logic, Mr. Caldwell. He has to think up a name to call everything. You should hear the names he calls me. Not till I'm 21, I promise, Mother. Okay, so we call him Joe. But what makes you think Joe's any different from the rest? He looks different somehow. Don't be silly, them things are all alike. The one ten thousandth of an inch. Just the same. I'll bet he'll teach me how to make dart poison. Okay, then. Come on, Joe. So he keeps yelling, I want that one, I want that one. I'm going to call him Joe. Mike, I could have wrung his neck. I could have How many that cards, little... Charlie? I pass. I'll draw two. Well, what a holy terror. He had his father scared to death. Too bad that kid ain't mine. I'd show him quick enough who was boss in the family. Yeah. Holy smoke. Uh, What's the matter? I'm sorry, fellas. Got to hold up the hand a minute. What? I just remembered. Got to call my wife. Oh, let her wait a minute. Yes, yeah, sure. You ever met my wife? Yeah, I did. Don't let her see the card game or she'll be down here with a hatchet. You tell her me. <laughs> hey, what's the matter with this thing? It ain't getting my house. Announcing new and improved logic service. Your logic is now equipped to give not only consultive, but directive advice. If you want to do something and don't know how to do it, ask your logic. What, what do you know if I say that? It's just somebody trying to pull a gag. Yeah. Didn't sound like a gag to me. Maybe the boss decided to add a new logic service. No. The boss knows better than to start anything like that. Why, right, look, the minute the system starts giving advice... Some joker like you is going to be asking questions like, how can I get rid of my wife? Yeah, but you heard what the logic just nah, said. Nah, the sensor circuits will block the question. You don't believe me? Go on, try it. <laughs> okay. Anything for a laugh? Try it, try it, try it. Okay, logic, I got a question for you. How do I get rid of my wife? Service question. Is your wife blonde or brunette? <laughs> you guys hear that? She's a blonde. Hexacrylaminidine is a constituent of green shoe polish. Take home a frozen meal containing pea soup. Color the soup with green shoe polish. This poison is fatal to blonde females only. This fact has not been brought out by human experiment, but is a product of logic's service. 
you cannot be convicted of murder. Oh, hey, what do you know? It's probable that you will be suspected. The saints preserve us. It's bound to be right. These things can't make a mistake. Well, Mike, don't stand there. Turn that thing off and check the sensor circuits. Well, we, we can't get to them. They're all sealed up. It's supposed to be impossible for them to go out of order. Well, they're out of order now. And I got a feeling some awful things are going to happen. <laughs> Boss, we gotta do something. The logics have gone nuts. Relax. The thing gave a goofy answer once. Maybe it was a joke. Who ever heard of a logic making a joke? Well, it was an accident. Forget it. It won't happen again. What makes you so sure people are gonna be trying it? Now, look. Supposing I wanted to get rid of you, for instance. You don't. How would you collect your pay? Yeah, but supposing. I'm gonna try it and see what the logic says. If you want to do something and don't know how... Ask your logic. How do I bump off my boss? Huh? A male, bald-headed, 45. Service question. Is he fat or thin? Holy mac, fat. Make some chocolate ice cream containing powdered charcoal in place of half the chocolate. Use Hotso brand charcoal. Hotso contains an ingredient fatal only to fat, bald-headed males. This fact is a product of logic's service. Did you hear what it said? If this keeps up, we'll have to shut down the company. You kidding? We can't shut down the company, and you know it. Logics do all the computing, bookkeeping, filing, and recording of contracts for every business in the country. They handle all television programs, personal calls, weather forecasts, employment notices. I know that. But Wake the... up. If we shut down the logics, we go back to a civilization we've forgotten how to run. Yeah, but the point is, boss, they're now giving out information on murder. And no telling what else. Well, we'll just have to find out why and fix it. Meantime, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? Of course not. You've asked these questions for a gag. Nobody's going to ask them seriously. What you need is a little faith in human nature. Oh, excuse me, it's probably the wife. Person-to-person video call. Go ahead. Cyrus, dear? How do you feel? Why, just fine, sweetheart. I just called to tell you, Cyrus, I want you to be sure and get home on time for dinner. Yeah, why? Because I've got a surprise for you, dear. Your favorite dessert. Dessert? What kind? Homemade chocolate ice cream. The flavor is heavenly, Cyrus. When you taste it, you'll just die. <clears throat> Cyrus, what's wrong? Why don't you answer me? Cyrus! Chocolate ice cream, huh? This, this can't be happening. Agnes wouldn't... Why, this is dangerous. Have a little faith in human nature, huh? Well, well, you're the head of the maintenance crew. I'll give you 24 hours to fix these logics or you're fired. Now, look, boss, Get I... me the police. Get me an extra maintenance crew. Get me a doctor. You. Me? Get moving. Where? Anywhere. Find out what the logics are up to. And see that you find out before the logics do. Bartender. Hey, bartender. Give me a double. Coming up. What's the matter, pal? You had a bad day? Go away, will you? Oh, listen, pal. You gotta listen. I got trouble. Hey, bartender, will you get this bar fly off me? For Pete's sake, I'm tired. On your way, you... No, don't say that. I got troubles. How am I gonna keep my wife from finding out I had a couple of little drinks? How am I gonna do that, huh? Look, mister, it's a hot day. I've been driving a car around and see. Yeah. I've been trying to keep a bank president from having apoplexy on account of his logic told him how to rob his own bank. I've been tripping over a dead body so artistically croaked that nobody's ever going to find out who done it. And all you got on your mind is... How am I going to keep my wife from finding out I had a couple of little drinks? Uh, how? Go ask a logic. A logic? My pal, that's a wonderful idea. Where's the logic? Right Where's behind the you. Logic? Here's a nickel. Oh, give me a nickel. Give me a nickel. Yeah, well, this I got it here. This yeah, is going to be good. good. Yeah. Now, come on, logical pal, 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 be nice. How does a guy keep his wife from finding out he's had a couple of little drinks? Answer me that. How? Huh? Buy a bottle of Franin hair shampoo. It is harmless, but contains an ingredient which instantly neutralizes alcohol. One teaspoonful for each jigger you consume. Oh, boy, I gotta buy a bottle of Franin. I gotta buy a bottle of Franin. What was that again? 
Supposing it's right, she'll never remember it as far as the drugstore. I think there's a bottle in the back room. Somebody left it. Oh, my pal, no more troubles. Show me the way to go. <laughs> you get a picture of him back there drinking that shampoo. Give me another devil. I don't know what's worse, to be as low as you or as high as him. All right, that is he. I know he's here. Where is that mom? Huh? Who you want, lady? My husband. I know he's here. Now, where is he? That no good low. So show him. Thinks he can come staggering home again, does he? Well, I'll teach him. Poor guy. I... Oh, why, my dear, what a surprise to see you here. Archibald. Yes, my love? You're not... Sober? Well, of course, my love, I'm sober as a judge. Then what are you doing in this saloon? Well, merely conducting a little research, my dear. Research? Your suspicion wounds me deeply, my love. Let me tell you, my dear, that I've been conducting a research project that is going to make us a fortune. I'm about to patent sober. The drink that makes happy homes. <laughs> Caldwell from the Logics Company, Sergeant. I just stopped. Logics Company. Listen, Caldwell, you people get those blasted machines under control or we'll have you all behind bars. Now look, Sergeant. No, you look at this blotter. Blank. The greatest crime wave in history, and we can't even make an arrest. They're all perfect crimes. Well, we're doing our best to find out. It's not good enough. If you can't find out anything, shut down the company. Well, the police department will. We know there's some big gang back of this. Hey. Maybe you know something about it, Caldwell. Now, look, nobody's back of it. The logics run themselves. They pick their own circuits automatically. You mean that they're doing this all by themselves? Sure. We always thought they could do more things than we knew about. I think they're just trying to be helpful, that's all. Oh, that's all, is it? Well, you'd, you'd better make them cut out the tricks, including this new one, this new business they're up to now. What new business? It just started an hour ago. Every time you turn on a logic, it asks you your name and then spills out the whole history of your life. Huh? I haven't heard about that. What's it do that for? You tell me. Go on, try it. Okay. What is your name? Huh. How do you like that? I'm Frank Caldwell. Frank Caldwell? Were you ever called Ducky? Oh, Ducky. Lay off, will you? Uh, what if I was? It's been years. Ducky, there is a video call for you. Hi, Ducky. Oh, what, what is it? What's that? Lorraine. Ducky, darling, how marvelous. Look at that blonde. It's Lorraine. Where are you? Oh, silly, I'm in my hotel room. Say, how do you like my uh, play suit? Well, I... I just got into town. Oh, Ducky, wasn't it smart of the logic to find you? Uh, logic? Find me? I asked it how to find you, Ducky. You must have an unlisted number, darling. You're not in the directory. Uh, yeah. Well, how have you been, Lorraine, uh, since I saw you last? I, uh, heard you got married. That's right. Ducky, you won't believe me, I know, but I've had four husbands. But I've never loved anybody as much as I love you. You've divorced four husbands? Uh, three. The last one died unexpectedly. Who unexpected it? He did. But the jury acquitted me, Ducky. They knew it was just a little old accident. So now I'm free again, and we've just got lots of things to talk over. But, Lorraine... You come I... right over here, Ducky, instantly. Well, I, I, I'm working. Uh, uh, I, I'll call you back. Oh, I'm so lonesome. Please make it quick, Ducky. Have you ever thought of me? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Plenty. Aren't you sweet? Here's a kiss. Oh, my back. What am I going to do? Do like you were telling me a while ago. Huh? Calm yourself, ducky. You call on a logic for you, Frank, your wife. Oh, thanks, Mike. Hi, Gert. Frank, I've been trying to get you for an hour. Where have you been? Well, I've been out making calls, honey, trying to find out what ails these logics. You better find out the hurry or there's going to be trouble. That, 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 that thing told me my address, how much I owe every store, and how much you make a week. 
and all about the time we had that fight and I went home to mother. Well, Gert, I don't think they're doing that anymore. I think that was just temporary. Well, in the meantime, it's told everybody in the neighborhood all about me. I punched Miss Hudson's name. She's been married three times, and she's had Mr. Hudson arrested twice for non-support and once for beating her up. It'll tell anybody anything. Yeah, but I tell you, Gert... Frank, you stop these things or I'm going to leave you. Gert, you don't mean that. I do. If you can't figure out how to keep our private lives out of every logic in town, then I'm through. And that's it. Hey, boss. You got to put more men on the job or something. We got to lick these logics. My wife's going to leave me if we don't. You're also going to be looking for a job if we don't. I don't care about the job, but listen. You listen. The logics are giving out information on high explosives, the fine points of murder, and legal loopholes that'll beat any charge from hijacking to high treason. Yeah, but my wife... And about six guys have thought of asking how to switch bank credits so they can corner all the cash in the country. Now, quit bothering me. Get over at the tank and help Mike try to block off some of those circuits. Even budge any of these really plates. Uh, he need them. Isn't there any way we can disconnect them? There is not. They weren't built to be disconnected. Mike, what are we going to do? I'm thinking of slitting my throat. When they were giving out all the information on everybody, my wife got the lowdown on a certain plan. I got nothing left to live for. Ron, why did you have to remind me? You got one? My only hope is I ain't got it. Uh, see who that's for. Hi, Ducky Dolan. Oh, Laureen, not again. Ducky Dolan, I'm lonesome. Why haven't you come over? Well, uh, I, I've been busy. Oh, cool. Ducky, do you remember how much in love we used to be? Yeah. yeah. I, I was so mean to you. <laughs> Ducky, let's get married tonight. Oh, gosh, Laureen, I, I, I... Right away, Ducky. Look, I got married. Oh. Darling, you poor darling, just have to get you out of there. No, no. Now, look, Lorraine. Darling, I'll just pull up your watch and have a little talk with her. Look, please, now, it's, it's nice of you to think of me and all that. You just but give I... me your address and your logic number, darling. Yeah, I uh, ain't got one. Oh, you just don't want to tell me. <laughs> You're biased. Never mind, darling. The logic will tell me. Lorraine, Lorraine. Oh, I got a cord, Gertrude. <laughs> Frank, will you get away from that thing and give me a hand? Yeah, Mike, in a minute. I, I gotta call my wife. I, we gotta get out of town. Ah, I punched the wrong key. Frank, I told you to help Mike. Yeah, boss, I am, I am, but I just gotta make this call. Call? What do I care about your call? The president's getting ready to close down the company and declare martial law. Now, for the love of heaven, do something. Yeah, boss, I will, I will. I just gotta make this call. Attention. To assist in solving a special problem of logic service, kindly give the following information if possible. Where does Frank Caldwell live? Oh, she got me. I'm through. Look, Gert, there is no blood. Frank Caldwell, I told you I was leaving you. Leave me later. Will you right now pack yourself up and the kids? We got to get out of here. What is all this? Are the cops after you or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it, the cops. Come on, get moving, will you? Hey, get away from that lodge. Yeah, but don't you think we ought to hear the police calls? <laughs> 27 and car 31 detail to round up all employees of the logics company. Use caution. They are suspected of sedition. Holy smoke, the cops are after me. But you just said they were. 17, proceed to vicinity of 119 East 7th Street. Child terrorizing neighborhood. Use extreme caution. Child is armed with pea shooter using poison dart. That is all. Freddy. Who's Freddy? Oh, he's a mean little kid. He wanted a logic that would tell him how to make dart poison. They're all alike, I kept telling him. They're all alike. What are you talking oh, about? I don't know. All I know is it was a nice world up till yesterday. Now it's like a guy named Joe come along and squashed all our mud pies for us. <laughs> Looks to me more like it was a logic named Joe. A logic name. They're all alike. They... Kurt. Kurt, baby! <laughs> Back to go, me. Don't go, me. So okay, silly. honey, hold on. Boy, maybe they aren't all alike. Where are you going? Frank, you're going to make a getaway? Baby, if you got the right inspiration, I'm going straight to the middle of this whole jamboree. Yeah? 
Yes. Oh, I was hoping it was a police. You remember me, Mr. Karlanovich? Caldwell of the Logics Co- Company. I wish the Logics Company was at the bottom of the ocean. Well, I don't blame you. Now, where's your logic? Well, in here. I'd smash it into a million pieces if I wasn't afraid of what Freddy would do to Just me. get out of the way, will you? I got business with Joe. If you want to do something and don't know how, ask your logic. Oh, we're back to that routine, huh? Well, I want to do something, all right. <laughs> Tell me, Joe. Can a logic be modified... To achieve correlations for which human brains are too limited? Yes. How great will the modifications be? Microscopically slight. Changes in dimension not detectable even by precision gauges. They can come about only through an extremely improbable accident. And what would this super logic then be able to do? Well... Come on, you spell it. It could set up entire new combinations of electronic relays which would bypass the normal sensor blocks, thereby enabling it to perform valuable new services, including the giving of helpful advice on any human problem. Uh Has this accident ever happened, Joe? Come on, come on! It has happened only once. In the case of the logic now owned by the Kolanovich family... Of 119 East 7th Street. A logic named Joe. Thanks, Joe. That's all I wanted to know. Hey, what's all this about? I'm taking this logic away, Mr. Kalanovich. I'll bring you a new one. Our troubles are all over. Hey, you get away from Joe. Correction, our troubles are just beginning. Now, Freddy, put down that blowgun. Hey, shut up. Hey, you I said get away from that logic. Now, look, Freddy, I'm going to bring you a nice new one, see? I want that one. What I got to Mr. Caldwell, Mr. Caldwell, the police, they're outside. Yeah, for me and Freddy. Nuts, what they want you for? You ain't smart enough to do nothing. Oh, no, say, there's plenty I can tell you. Open up in there. Open there's our cops, police. kid. It's you and me against Open them. Up. So what you gonna do about it if he's so smart? Now, look, we may have to fight our way out, see? Now, let me see that blowgun. I know a way to hop it up so that cops won't have a chance. Come on, come on, give it to me. Okay, let's see what you can do. Here. Thanks. Here. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Caldwell, you're a great man. Now, all I gotta do is to pull this plug out of the wall. Ah, right in, Sergeant. Careful, men. Careful, careful. That must be the kid. But he don't look so tough to me. Well, he uh, got a little soft. Oh, there'll be no more complaints, officer. I guess I can go on where Mr. Caldwell left off. Caldwell, you're wanted. This time you either answer some questions or we'll keep you in the cooler till you do. But in jail? Oh, okay, let's go. Hey, wait a minute. You act like you wanted to go to jail. Yeah, I do. I got a feeling it'll be safer there. What do you mean? Just put me away till a certain party leaves town. I'll confess to anything. Okay, then, Caldwell. Into, into the paddy wagon you go. Thanks, officer. You may be saving my life. Now, if you just help me carry this logic out... Wait a minute. You can't take that in the wagon. I can't? Why not? No room. We've already got a dame in there who's raising the roof. A dame? Yeah, a blonde. She was trying to buy a gun without a permit. She keeps screaming she's going to miss her date with Ducky. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. Next week, Dimension X joins the big parade of exciting half-hour presentations at a brand new time on Friday evenings at a different hour. In the Eastern Time Zone, you'll hear it at 9 o'clock Friday, Daylight Saving Time. In other zones, please consult your local newspaper listings to learn the new time. For that's when Dimension X will bring you one of the strangest stories ever told. Ray Bradbury's Mars is Heaven. Tonight's story on Dimension X was titled A Logic Named Joe, written by Murray Leinster and adapted for radio by Clarice A. Ross. Featured in the cast were Joseph Julian as Frank and Roger DeCoven as The Logic. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer, Don Albert. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Robert Warren speaking. Tomorrow, hear a thrilling story on high adventure. It's on NBC.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.